Oh, no, no, it's, 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 it's here. I'll just give you an example from a previous one. So, for instance, this is a statement. Error system, or it might not be error. So, that one I'd say triple zero one, or would I say. Uh, there's um, actual, for instance, here there's, um, so tab one kind of thing. So, you, if you just go tab one and then the last. Four digits or so right. that, that's, yeah, that'll be yeah, fine. And yeah, that's that's yeah, really okay. And then yeah, we'll just flick it up to all the screens and then all these ones as well, and we'll just mirror up everything. So, it's yeah. all right. And uh, the running transcript, yeah, where will that appear on my screen? Uh, that's going to be on this one as well. Once it goes live and the ladies get yeah. here, yeah. that'll be here. So, what we usually do is put half the transcript on one side and then yep. your documents on the other side. Okay, great. So, I've got a split screen. No, definitely, yes. And that way, yeah, that's just live. And then you can just, yeah, read along or. Yeah. If I wish to scroll through a document, do I ask that to be done? Oh, no. Um, it, if you, it depends if you're examining the witness, then, um, then you obviously, yeah. You ask, I've got to scroll up or down, or go to a specific page. Yeah, so we or just have that power. Uh, is that done by us? No, that, that's done by us. So we just virtually kind of do a structure. And then that way, yeah. Just need to be clear about the structure. Yeah, we'll do it just the yeah, best you can. So you've got, um, yeah, like if you want to just look at a document on this or for research, then yeah, you've got the mouse and that belongs. So I'm able do. to look at a document, I start a document, and small document. That's correct, yes. And then that way, you just this document. Oh, um, transcript document. No, you can, this is, that's what this is for here. Um, so, yeah, so this one's um, mirrored for everyone. Yeah. And then um, this one here, you just have your documents with everyone. Okay, that's very clear. That's right. Okay. Because all of these GPOs and that, um, you have to go around and see how the evacuation will look like. No. Uh, it, it was a what time was that? About an hour. But you can say it. It's just, it's just a drill. But we don't or in the galley for exercise. Yeah. 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 Very good, thank you, sir. Sorry, so this one? Yeah, and then uh, Karen is going to be Wonderful. next year, and then there's a back there, and that's the uh, um, okay. screen that mirrors everything. Is that it? Oh, okay. So there's going to be like a slight oh, separation yeah. between. Uh, that's right. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and Tim, no slashes after that? That's correct. That's, um, one of them is going to be uh, display, I believe, and one yep. of them is the other document as well. So. No problem. That's no, all right. Pleasure. Thank you. Tim, you're already next year. I mean, this is What one? Tim. No, not that one. Just that one. Um, 
I'll look at that, that one. Uh, I'm sorry, that oh, one no. wouldn't help us. Yes. Uh, Get to no, no, you use your ADM. Okay. 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 Yeah, yeah. My ADM is weird because it's actually my full name, not ADM. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, one, no one's sitting there, it's fine. Um, like, could you put in my own yeah. I don't even know who the commissioners are yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't know what the charge.
silence also. <coughs> Good morning, Mr. Beckett. Good morning, uh, Your Honour, Commissioner Atkinson. I appear instructed by Mr. Camparialle and Ms. Zeeve and Ms. McNair, and Mr. Junior is also at the uh, bar table this morning. Thank um, you. I think we have a number of appearances from those who have been granted leave. Perhaps we'll take the appearances now. Thank you. Your Honour, I seek leave to appear for AHA. Thank you, Ms. McGlinchey, and leave has previously been granted. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honour. Kernigan, I seek leave, which has previously been granted for Barbara Taylor. Thank you, Mr Kernigan. And yes, leave has previously been granted. Thank you, Your Honour. Uh, Honour Commissioner, please. My name's Higgins. I understand leave's already been granted. I appear for Brian Houston and Hillsong Church Limited. Thank you, Mr Higgins. As if the Commission pleases, my name's Chowdhury, spelled C-H-O-W-D-H-U-R-Y, initials M-C. Instructed by Corney and Linda Lawyers, I appear for Australian Christian Churches. Thank you, Mr Chowdhury. Yes, Mr Beckett. Your Honour, I understand there's a further appearance from uh, Northside Christian Church, um, but I'm not aware as to why Council is not here at the moment, so I'll have some investigations made about, about that. Um, if I could commence with the opening. Yes, thank you. The Royal Commission will commence its 18th year today in Sydney with a consideration of the response of the Australian Christian churches and affiliated Pentecostal churches to allegations of child sexual abuse. The Royal Commission is sitting under the Royal Commission's Act of the Commonwealth as well as the Royal Commission's Act of New South Wales, the Commissions of Inquiry Act of Queensland and the Constitution Act 1975 of Victoria. And that's because this public hearing will hear evidence in relation to churches in New South Wales, in Victoria and in Queensland. All of the churches and related institutions in this case study are part of the Pentecostal movement in Australia. The churches that will be examined were known until recently as Assemblies of God churches because they are and were affiliated with the Assemblies of God in Australia. The AOG was founded in 1937 and is Australia's largest Pentecostal movement. It has approximately 1,000 churches affiliated to it. In 2007, it changed its name to Australian Christian Churches. Affiliated churches of the AOG, now unfortunately known as the ACC, work together in voluntary cooperation uniting for evangelism, fellowship, order and discipline. One official from a member church described the role of the ACC as primarily relating to registration of the church, ordination applications, accreditation of pastors and investigation of grievances against credentialed ministers. Church affiliates of the ACC are otherwise independent of the ACC and cannot be directed or governed by it. The ACC does exercise, however, moral persuasion and provides models for policy governance to its affiliates. All of the churches in this case study have been separately incorporated. The AOG has had both a state executive in each of the states to be examined and has a national executive. The term Pentecostalism comes from the day of the Pentecost, which occurs 50 days after Easter and marks the coming of the Holy Spirit to the Apostles. Pentecostalism is based on a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, signified by speaking in tongues, prophecy and healing. It is also described as a denomination of Protestantism. This case study will be divided into three parts. The first part will examine allegations of child sexual abuse made against Pastor Frank Houston in 1999 and the re response of the Sydney and Hills Christian Life Centres, now called Hillsong Church, to those allegations. The Royal Commission will also examine the response of the AOG to the allegations. 
The second part of the case study will examine allegations of child sexual abuse made against Kenneth Sanderlands, who taught at Northside Christian College from 1983 to 1992, and the response of the Northside Christian Centre Incorporated to those allegations. Those bodies are located in Bandura in Melbourne. Northside Christian Centre Incorporated is now known as Encompass Church. The Royal Commission will also examine the response of the AOG to those allegations. The third part of the case study will examine allegations of child sexual abuse made in 2007 against Jonathan Baldwin, who was a youth pastor at a Sunshine Coast <coughs> church. This part will provide a relatively recent example of the response of a local church to allegations of child sexual abuse. The Royal Commission will also examine its response and that of the ACC during the criminal trial and conviction that ensued, and then a process of civil claim. The Royal Commission will also examine the systems, policies, practices and procedures for the reporting and responding to allegations of child sexual abuse in the ACC, in the Hillsong Church and in Encompass Church. Turning first then to Hillsong Church and the allegations against Frank Houston. This first part of the public hearing will consider the responses by Sydney Christian Life Centre and Hills Christian Life Centre and the AOG to allegations of child sexual abuse made against Pastor William Francis or Frank Houston. Frank Houston was ordained as a Salvation Army officer in New Zealand in his early life. However, he moved from the Salvation Army and in 1960 established his first Assemblies of God church in Lower Hutt, New Zealand. From 1965 to 1971, he rose to occupy the position of Superintendent of the New Zealand Assemblies of God. Frank Houston came to Australia on occasion during those years in order to preach. In 1977, Frank Houston established the Sydney Christian Life Centre and was based in Australia. In 1978, Frank Houston's son Brian and daughter-in-law Bobby joined the ministry there. In 1983, Brian and Bobby Houston founded the Hills Christian Life Centre and the two churches merged in 1999, renaming itself Hillsong Church. Today, Hillsong Church spans 12 countries, including Australia. According to Hillsong, 11,000 people attend the Borkham Hills side of the Hillsong Church each weekend and 35,000 across Australia. Both the Sydney Christian Life Centre and Hills Christian Life Centre were affiliates of the AOG. Brian Houston was the national president of the AOG from 1997 through to 2009. Today, as before, Hillsong Church is an affiliate of the ACC. Now, um, a witness who we will refer to as AHA was a seven-year-old boy in 1969 when he and his family were heavily involved in the local Assemblies of God Church. His family members were good friends with Frank Houston, who often visited from New Zealand to preach. In 1969 and 1970, Frank Houston sometimes with his family, came and, came and stayed in AHA's home in Sydney. The, witnesses, the evidence is likely to reveal that AHA remembers Frank Houston coming into his bedroom at night and touching him sexually when he was staying with them. He said that this happened numerous times over a period of years, but stopped when he reached puberty. AHA is also likely to say that when he was about 16 year old, years old in 1978, he told his mother of the sexual abuse. She said to him she was concerned about the effect on the church, and as a result, AHA says he did not pursue the allegations at that time. The evidence is likely to show that in October 1998, AHA's mother attended an Assemblies of God church called Emmanuel Christian Family Church and disclosed there that Frank Houston had sexually abused her son about 30 years ago. 
The senior pastor of that church at the time was Pastor Barbara Taylor. The public hearing will explore how Pastor Barbara Taylor and evangelist Kevin, quote, mad dog, close quote, Morgan, came to learn of the allegation. AHA is likely to give evidence that both came to his house that evening and confronted him about it. In about November of 1998, both Pastor Taylor and Kevin Mudford told Pastor John McMartin, an executive member of the New South Wales Assemblies of God, that they knew of the allegations of child sexual abuse against a pastor. Pastor Taylor is likely to say that she did not provide the name of the alleged perpetrator or victim to Pastor McMartin at that time in deference to AHA's wishes. She's likely to give evidence based on her correspondence that Pastor McMartin suggested to her that the matter be taken to Brian Houston as head of the National Assemblies of God. However, she declined to do so and instead spoke directly with Frank Houston, who denied the allegations. On the 26th of February 1999, Pastor Taylor wrote to Frank Houston to arrange for him to speak with AHA about the allegations. After some, some delay, in about May 1999, AHA spoke on the phone with Frank Houston, who provided him with a prolonged apology. Pastor Taylor told Pastor McMartin of the call. The hearing will explore what information was passed to senior members of the Assemblies of God at this time. In May 1999, the National Conference of the AAG adopted its administration manual which governs the process for the removal of an ordained minister's credentials. The Royal Commission will explore whether the AOG adhered to its administration manual. On the 16th of September 1999, Pastor Taylor and Pastor McMartin met, and the evidence is likely to be that she named Frank Houston as the alleged abuser of AHA. Pastor McMartin told her that the Assemblies of God had a structure in place to deal with such matters. Pastor McMartin is likely to give evidence that he contacted Wayne Alcorn for advice about the complaint because Mr Alcorn was on the National Executive. Pastor McMartin understood that the decision for the National Executive was... that the decision to refer it to the National Executive was made because Frank Houston was a high-profile minister but was unaware who made that decision. In October 1999, Kevin Mudford told the then business manager of the Hills Christian Life Centre, George Agajanian, of AHA's allegation against Frank Houston. The evidence is likely to reveal that Mr Agajanian then spoke with Brian Houston, who said he would speak with Frank Houston about the allegation. Brian Houston is said to have later reported to Mr Agajanian that the allegation had been admitted. On 28th of November 1999, Pastor Taylor met with Pastor McMartin and Brian Houston about the allegations. The evidence is likely to reveal that the meeting heard that Frank Houston had confessed to a lesser incident, which he said was a one-off. According to Pastor Taylor, Brian Houston said he was in shock and his father would be stood down from preaching. He also apparently said he had spoken to a barrister who had told him that if the matter went to court, his father would surely be incarcerated for the crime. AHA is likely to give evidence that he was not contacted by officers of the Assemblies of God to provide his account of sexual abuse. However, he did have a number of conversations with Frank Houston at about this time. On the 22nd of December 1999, a special executive meeting of the Assemblies of God was convened at the Qantas Club at Sydney Airport. Keith Ainge, former National Secretary, will give evidence that this was an urgent meeting convened at the request of Brian Houston. As AOG President, Brian Houston was in attendance with Vice President John Lewis. Mr Ainge and Mr Alcorn were also at the meeting. The hearing will explore the extent of Mr Houston's involvement in the meeting. The minutes record that AHA did not want to make a formal complaint, but that Frank Houston had confessed. It is noted that Brian Houston had already suspended the credential of his father 
and this was endorsed by the meeting. In addition to his credential being withdrawn, the executive determined that Frank Houston be supervised, that he refrain from public ministry for 12 months and be invited to enter the AOG restoration program, as well as be offered counselling. He was determined not to notify the Assemblies of God movement of the disciplinary action in the interest of the complainant. Mr Ainge is likely to give evidence that the National Executive considered whether they did to compulsorily report the offence to police. The Executive determined to give Brian Houston the task of conveying the decision to Frank Houston and then also meeting with AHA to explain the discipline and restoration process and to offer him counselling. Mr Ainge is likely to give evidence that the allegation was not to be publicly communicated. Mr Ainge is also likely to give evidence that this was the first time that he became aware of the allegations. The public hearing will explore the nature of Brian Houston's role in the resolution of AHA's allegations and his interaction with both Frank Houston and AHA. AHA is likely to give evidence that Frank Houston called him a number of times about the allegations and to organise some money for him as compensation. In 2000, a meeting was held at the Thornley branch of McDonald's between AHA, Frank Houston and an unnamed third man. At the meeting, Frank Houston offered AHA $10,000 and said, I want your forgiveness for this. He was passed a napkin to sign if he accepted the $10,000. After he signed the napkin, he was told that a cheque would be sent to him and to contact Brian Houston if there was any problem. About two months later, when the cheque had not turned up, AHA says he called Brian Houston. He was told by Brian Houston during that conversation that he would get the money to him, that is, Mr Houston would get the money to him, and about two weeks later, AHA received a cheque for $10,000 in the mail. There was no covering note. Brian Houston is likely to say that he was told that there were in fact two payments to AHA totalling $12,000, and there was also a signed document which he saw. On 22nd of November 2000, <coughs> so approximately a year later, a further national executive meeting of the Assemblies of God was held. The minutes record that Brian Houston, Mr Lewis, Mr Alcorn and Mr Ainge attended the meeting. The evidence is likely to reveal that Pastor Brian Houston told the meeting a further complainant had come forward to make an allegation of inappropriate sexual behaviour 33 years ago in New Zealand. He also informed the meeting that the New Zealand Assemblies of God was investigating further allegations against Frank Houston from two to five people. The meeting confirmed that Frank Houston's credential remained withdrawn and he was not free to preach until all accusations were dealt with. Further, the evidence is likely to reveal that the National Executive determined that if Frank Houston admitted to the new allegation, then he would never have his credential reissued and restoration would be abandoned. It was determined that Frank Houston would be provided with an opportunity to respond to the allegations, and New South Wales Executive Member Robert Ferguson was given the task. In addition, Mr Lewis and Mr Ainge were asked to travel to New Zealand to explain the position to the New Zealand Assemblies of God, assess the allegations in that country and prepare a statement for ratification by the National Executive of the Australian AOG. Mr Lewis and Mr Ainge flew to New Zealand and met with the Executive of the New Zealand AOG. They were informed that the New Zealand AOG had substantial allegations that Frank Houston had touched the genitals of six boys about 30 years ago. They said they had no reason to doubt the complainants. It was revealed to Mr Lewis and Mr Ainge that at least 50 New Zealand pastors were aware of the allegations against Frank Houston. On 29th of November 2000, Mr Lewis and Mr Ainge finalised their report to the Australian Assemblies of God. Their report also reveals that 
Robert Ferguson confronted Frank Houston with allegations concerning four men from New Zealand. Only four of the six men were prepared to be identified. The evidence is likely to reveal that Frank Houston could not remember the first three incidents, but did not deny them. He said there was, quote, a continuing problem during this period of time, end quote. And he confessed that an improper incident had taken place with the fourth complainant. Frank Houston then said to Mr Ferguson that he has now retired and will not preach anymore. Frank Houston's resignation was tabled on the same day at a meeting of Hills Christian Life Centre chaired by Brian Houston. The evidence is likely to reveal that there was a discussion of a retirement package for Frank Houston and his wife. The minutes also record that a simple announcement concerning Frank's retirement would be made. The hearing will explore what that announcement was. At the same time of completing the report, Mr Lewis and Mr Ainge prepared a statement on behalf of the AOG concerning Frank Houston. It records that there had been allegations of a serious moral failure by Frank Houston 30 years ago and that he had admitted to the failure. The statement says that, the, that it is only to be used to respond to rumours or if Frank Houston engages in public ministry or if the national executive wishes to make a public decision. The public hearing will explore what steps, what steps were taken by Hillsong and the Assemblies of God to approach AHA about the admitted abuse. It will also explore what Brian Houston, Hillsong Church and the state and national executives of the Assemblies of God said publicly and to their respective members about the allegations and admissions by Frank Houston and the reasons for the withdrawal of his credential. The evidence is likely to reveal that on 24th of December 2001, Mr Lewis wrote to all ordained and probationary ministers of the Assemblies of God Australia, informing them that a serious allegation against Frank Houston had been made in 1999 and Brian Houston had suspended his father's credential. In the letter, Mr Lewis then repeated the terms of the earlier statement referring to a quote, serious moral failure, end quote. Ministers were, were requested not to make an announcement at each church or further afield. The public hearing will also explore whether appropriate steps were taken by Hillsong Church under the New South Wales Commission for Children and Young People Act to notify the Commission that Frank Houston had been disciplined as a result of admissions of child sexual abuse. In December 2002, Further allegations of child sexual abuse were made by AHG that Frank Hewson sexually abused him in New Zealand. The evidence is likely to reveal that the Australian AOG determined that there was no role for the Australian AOG because the matter had happened in New Zealand. Frank Hewson was a New Zealand pastor at that time and he was affiliated with the New Zealand Assemblies of God. The public hearing will explore whether the Australian AOG considered the provision of assistance or support to AHG. Frank Houston died in 2004. In February 2009, Brian Houston was provided with further allegations of child sexual abuse. The allegations concerned abuse of AHH more than 30 years previously in New Zealand. Brian Houston was in email contact with AHH's wife and offered to meet him in New Zealand. The evidence is likely to reveal that no allegations of child sexual abuse against Frank Houston have been referred to the police and no civil proceedings have been commenced in Australia relevant to allegations against him. The hearing will explore Hillsong's current policies and procedures for addressing complaints of child sexual abuse and the protection of children. We will also examine the interaction of Hillsong and the ACC at the state and national levels over allegations of child sexual abuse and protection of children. It is anticipated that the Royal Commission will hear from six witnesses in relation to the Hillsong Church in this case study. First, 
AHA will give evidence of his abuse by Frank Houston and the response of Brian Houston and the Assemblies of God to his disclosures. We will also hear from Barbara Taylor, current pastor of the Emmanuel Christian Family Church, who facilitated the reporting of AHA's <coughs> abuse to the Hillsong Church and AOG. Two current employees of Hillsong Church will give evidence in the public hearing. The Royal Commission will hear evidence from George Agajanian, the current general manager of Hillsong Church, and Brian Houston, who is the current senior pastor of Hillsong Church. It is also anticipated that two individuals will give evidence regarding the role of the Australian Christian churches in responding to disclosures of child sexual abuse by Pastor Frank Houston. Keith Ainge is the former National Secretary of the Assemblies of God Australia, and John McMartin is the current New South Wales State President of the ACC. I move now to the second part of the hearing, Northside Christian Centre in Ken Sanderlands. In this part, the Royal Commission will consider the response of Northside Christian Centre, who for ease of reference I will refer to as the Church, and the Assemblies of God to allegations of child sexual abuse made against former teacher Kenneth or Ken Sanderlands. Since 1979, the Church has operated a primary and secondary school at Bandura in the northern suburbs of Melbourne, known as Northside Christian College. Mr Sandlands taught primary school classes there from 1983 to 1992. The church has been an affiliate of the Assemblies of God since 1952 and is currently operating under the name Encompass Church. The church launched the Northside Christian College, which I will call the college, in 1979. It is located on the same campus as the church in Bandura and was established as part of the church's ministry. In 1985, the church incorporated as Northside Christian Centre incorporated, but the college remained unincorporated and under the control of the church. Until 2002, the college was operated on a day-to-day -day basis by the Northside Christian College Executive Council, also known as the College Council. However, the board of the church made all substantive decisions, including financial decisions for the college. The senior pastor of the church held the position of chairman on both the church board and the college council. Other members of the college council included the associate pastor of the church and the college principal. During Mr Sanderland's time at the college, the chairman was Pastor Dennis Smith, he was succeeded in 1998 by Pastor John Spinella. In 2002, the college was incorporated as an association separate from the church. The rules of Northside Christian College Incorporated require that one seat on the college board is to be occupied by a pastor from the church. In addition, the church must ratify who may become a member of the association and may also remove the endorsement of a member. Mr Sanderlands was born in 1945 and completed teacher training in 1969. He taught at St Paul's Anglican Primary School at Frankston, Victoria, now called the Woodley School, before he was appointed to the college in 1983 by Pastor Smith. From 1983 to 1992, Mr Sanderlands taught grades one to four at the college. The children were accordingly between the ages of about six and nine. The evidence is likely to reveal that allegations were made by a number of children and their parents to the school over the period 1985 to 1993. As the Royal Commission will hear, some of those allegations were explicitly sexual, some were complaints of physical conduct, some of showing pictures of naked people or drawings of genitalia, and some of discussing sexual matters with children. For the purposes of this public hearing, four victims of Mr Sanderlands have been chosen to illustrate the nature of the abuse and the matter in which Mr Sanderlands abused children at the school. Those victims are AGA, AGH, AGN and AGC. AGA will give evidence at the public hearing. 
The evidence is likely to show that over the 10-year period that Mr Sanderlands taught at the college, allegations which amounted to or may have indicated child sexual abuse were received by the college and church from about 30 children. After a plea of guilty, Mr Sanderlands was convicted in November 2000 of 13 counts of indecent assault of a minor against eight victims and sentenced to two years imprisonment. Following his criminal conviction, seven former students of Mr Sanderlands commenced civil proceedings alleging he had sexually abused him, them. All were settled after mediation in 2001 and 2002. AGH. AGH gave a statement to police as part of the prosecutions which occurred in 2000. She joined Mr Sanderland's class in 1985 when she was in Grade 2. Her police statement is likely to reveal that Mr Sanderland's often had her sit on his lap while in class. She estimated this occurred weekly for the year, sometimes more. She recalls him putting his hand under her skirt and underpants and rubbing and tickling her vagina, in her words. She also recalls him inserting his finger into her vagina while she was sitting on his lap in front of the other class members. And as she had seen him do it with other children, she thought this was all right. AGH, AGH also recalls being asked to stay after school once or twice to pick up all the books or pack things up. When the other children had left the classroom, Mr Sanderlands had her sit on his lap where he placed his hand under her underwear and into her vagina. AGH recalls that Mr Sanderlands touched and kissed a lot of the girls. She also recalls that Mr Sanderlands hit her with a wooden paddle once or twice. On those occasions, he told her to bend over, pull down her skirt and underwear, and then he hit her three to six times with the paddle. AGH did not tell anyone at the time, but went to another school for grade three. AGA. AGA commenced a Mr Sanderland's class at the college in 1986 at the age of six. AGA is likely to give evidence that she was sexually abused by Mr Sanderland's for the three years she was in his grades one, two and three class. AGA will say that during class, Mr Sandlands took her outside their classroom with his typewriter. They sat on a wooden bench where he made up stories about her family having vaginal or oral sex, had her type them out and then made her sign each story. Mr Sandlands told her that if she ever told anyone, she would not be believed. AGA will say that when she tried to deny that the story had happened, Mr Sanderlands hit her with a wooden paddle on her backside in the sports room at the back of the classroom. AGA will also give evidence that on one occasion, Mr Sanderlands made her bend at the waist, holding a chair while he lifted her dress and removed her bloomers and knickers. He then touched her vagina from behind, stopping only to hit her on the backside with the paddle. She is likely to say that he counted out 12 hits. There were also other times when he felt her vagina. AGA will also give evidence that Mr Sandlands treated the boys differently from the girls in her class. For example, Mr Sandlands often did not allow any of the girls in the class to go to the toilet during class time. This sometimes resulted in girls wetting themselves. AGA will say that Mr Sanderlands made the girls take off their knickers and then he left the room to wash the underwear, which he hung up outside the class. The girls did not receive any replacement underwear to put on and were given back their underwear only after it had dried. AGA is also likely to say that she was made to sit between <coughs> Mr Sanderlands' legs with her back up to his groin while he read a book to the class. She said... She could feel his penis and he moved his legs in and out and up and down. AGA says that in grade two in 1987, she told a teacher by the name of Mrs Anne Brown that Mr Sanderlands had touched her breasts and made her sit between <coughs> his legs. She recalls going to a meeting with a number of men and Mrs Brown. 
She says that she was told it would be dealt with and not to tell anyone. She says she asked those at the meeting to be moved to another class, but this was rejected. She was later placed in Mrs Sanderland's class for Grade 3. The evidence is likely to reveal that Mr Sanderland's was reviewed twice in 1987 in relation to suspicions about his physical contact with children, including AGA. On the first occasion in 1987, Mr Sanderland's was given guidelines, but not disciplined. On the second occasion in October 1987, which concerned AGA, he was given a warning, but allowed to continue teaching. AGN. AGN also gave a statement to the police as part of the police prosecution in 2000. She had Sanderlands as her teacher for three years from 1987 to 1989. In her statement, AGN remembers Mr Sanderlands requiring the girls to stay in his class while they changed their clothes for sport in front of him. The boys in his class were, however, permitted to go into a back room to change. AGN also says she remembers going up to Mr Sanderlands to ask him a question and being made to stand between his open legs. She recalls being squeezed tightly by his legs while he asked if she loved him. On these occasions, he stroked her thighs and patted her bottom, sometimes stroking the inside of her thighs. On still further occasions, she was required to kiss him on the cheek. In AGN's police statement, she says that in grade one, she remembers wetting herself in class and being asked to stay behind while other children went to art class. Mr Sanderlands made her take off her pants and gave her a lecture. Then he took her into a small room where she was told to put her hands on the back of a chair and bend over. He felt her bottom and then hit her with the wooden paddle. On other occasion, Mr Sanderland took AGN to the toilet to wash her underwear and while she was on the toilet, told her to keep the cubicle door open. AGC. AGC also provided a statement to the police in 2000. He was in grade three in 1989 when he was eight years old. He was taught mathematics and English by Mr Sanderlands. In his police statement, AGC recalls Mr Sanderlands frequently coming up behind him in class and rubbing his chest. He also often told AGC that he loved him and on occasions when AGC did not reciprocate, Mr Sanderlands hit him with a wooden paddle in a back room. On another occasion, he recalls being in trouble in class and Mr Sanderlands telling him to go into the back room. There, Mr Sanderlands sat him on his lap, then placed his hands under his shorts and underwear and played with his penis for about 30 seconds. On a further occasion, AGC was kept back in class with another student to finish his work. While doing his work, Mr Sanderlands approached him and put his hands down the front of his pants and touched his penis and testicles. AGC says that Mr Sanderlands was a very touchy-feely type of person and was always rubbing his and other students' legs and hugging them. He frequently grabbed AGC's bottom. AGC remembers telling the father of another student that Mr Sanderlands had touched him on the penis. Other victims. Further evidence will reveal that between 1983 and 1989, Mr Sanderlands allegedly sexually abused 26 more children at the college, all of whom were in Mr Sanderlands' class during grade one to grade three or under his care and supervision while he taught there. Evidence to be tendered in relation to Mr Sanderlands' victims at the school is likely to show that his actions towards children, including the following, not necessarily at the same time, required children to say that they loved him, he used favouritism, he made girls but not boys change their clothes in front of him, invited children to sit on his knees or between his legs, pressed children against his groin while they were between his legs, put his hands under girls' skirts or into a boy's pants, put his hands inside children's underwear, stroked their bottoms, legs, chest, stomach or inside their th thighs. He showed some children drawings of genitalia and discussed sexual acts. He required children to remove their pants so that they could be beaten with a wooden paddle on the bottom. He touched the genitals of both boys and girls. 
and digit digitally penetrated the vagina of one girl. I turn first to the allegations against Sandland during the period 1986 to October 1987. In December 1986, allegations about Mr Sandland's were communicated to the then principal Ken Ellery. I'll call these the first allegations. After his assessment, he reported up to Pastor Smith that there was no case against him, or at least no case proven. Mr Ellery said that any, any appearances of imprudent relationships, his term, would be difficult to defend. Sanderlands was told to avoid situations where anybody could impute evil in his conduct. Further allegations were received in March 1987 from three grade five, six girls of Mr Sanderlands having grade one and two girls on his knee and touching them on the lower stomach and legs. I'll call this the second allegations. Interviews by Mr Ellery's successor as principal, Neil Rooks, and Mrs Brown revealed some inconsistency in the, in the girls' stories, but an element of sincerity and concern. The young children involved said they had sat on Mr Sanderland's lap and been cuddled, and that Mr Sanderland's had encouraged them to express their love for him. The evidence is likely to show that one of those girls was AGA. Mr Rooks reported to Pastor Smith that Mr Sanderlands had been warned and specifically instructed not to touch the children. He was concerned about the potential danger to the school's reputation and said, if any future such incidents were able to be proved undeniably, then I would have no hesitation at all to recommend instant suspension and dismissal. He referred to the matter as a long-standing situation with which I am only recently acquainted. Pastor Ingram from the church then assessed the same circumstances and found in his report of 6 of April 1987 to Pastor Smith that, quote, the incident spoken of was largely embellished by the girls, end quote. He thought that abuse in front of a class was highly unlikely and that having a grade one or two child on a teacher's knee would be quite normal in a teaching situation. Mr Sanderlands denied any untoward action and also said that he had never been told not to touch children. Pastor Ingram recommended there be no disciplinary action, but that Mr Sanderlands be given guidelines to comply with. The parents of the children concerned were to be told the facts and the grade five, six girls who reported were to be given a firm lecture. The recommendations were accepted by Pastor Smith. Mr Sanderlands was then, at Pastor Smith's command, given a set of guidelines to comply with. I'll call those the April 1987 guidelines. They were, in seven parts, not to touch any child apart from a pat on the back or a handshake, that he was not to pick up a child, who is not to place, instruct or allow any child to sit on his knee. He was not to remain in any room with a child on his or her own. Rediscipline, he was to refer to the principal or deputy principal any child for the usual discipline procedure. Uh, if any female child seeks attention about a sore knee, pain in the stomach, a problem with clothing, etc., then Mr Sandlands was required to refer them to a female teacher, and he was not to use the sick room as a teaching area. In October 1987, further allegations arose that Mr Sanderlands had children on his lap and he had kissed a child, the third allegations. The matter was considered by Mr Rooks and Pastor Ingram. Mr Sanderlands was confronted and admitted doing both and breaching the guidelines. He said he did it weekly and had kissed a further child on her birthday. Mr Rooks and Pastor Ingram reported again to Pastor Smith. Mr Sanderlands was given a severe reprimand and adherence to the guidelines was made a condition of his position. He remained teaching at the college. Uh, 1987 to 1991. The evidence is likely to reveal still further allegations of child sexual abuse by Mr Sandlands were made to the college and its staff during the period November 1987 to July 1991. 
The evidence is likely to reveal that in 1987, a teacher at the school, Margaret Furlong, was told by AGV that Mr Sanderlands had touched her in an old tram situated on the same property as the college. I'll call these the fourth allegation. She understood this to mean the touching was inappropriate, quote unquote, and reported it to Mr Sanderlands, who denied it. She then reported the matter to the principal, Mr Rooks, who said, leave it to me. Mrs Furlong is also likely to give evidence that AGA also told her in 1988 that Mr Sanderlands had touched her, the fifth allegation. She spoke with AGA's grade four teacher who did not believe there could be anything untoward in Mr Sanderlands' behaviour to AGA. Mrs Furlong also reported her complaint to Mr Rooks and Mr Rooks acknowledged it. That was her term. The hearing will examine what happened with this complaint. AGW also came forward to Mrs Furlong in 1989 and complained that he had been touched by Mr Sanderlands when, he was, when she was younger. Again, she reported her abuse to Mr Rooks and he acknowledged it. The hearing will examine what happened with this complaint. Mrs Furlong said she was not aware of investigations into Mr Sanderland's conduct, but noticed that he continued to teach until he left the school on the ground of failing eyesight, she thought. Allegations against Mrs Sanderland's during the period 1991 and 1992. In August 1991, Mr Sanderland's was alleged to have invited four girls to frontally embrace him and wriggle around, and also embrace him from behind and touch his genital area. I'll call these the seventh allegations. A parent had reported to a pastor at an Assemblies of God affiliated church in Glenroy who passed the report on to Pastor Smith. Mr Sanderlands was interviewed about the report and denied any impropriety. Kerry Lovell, a part-time school counsellor and teacher, was involved in the interviews and concluded that there was no reason to doubt Mr Sanderlands' integrity, but as she said, the cuddling of students was cause for concern. A meeting was held between Pastors Smith and Ingram, Mr Rooks and Deputy Principal Simon Murray, at which they determined that Mr Sanderlands had not broken the legality of the 1987 guidelines, but had broken the spirit of them. They considered that his employment beyond the end of 1991 was subject to a significant and measurable change of behaviour, quote unquote. Mr Sanderlands was given an admonishment and rebuked for breaking the guidelines and told to change his approach to teaching. The group considered the matter, including Pastor Smith and Mr <coughs> Rooks, determined that Mr Sanderlands' intentions were pure and in no way sexually oriented. A further allegation was made in April 1992 when a parent came forward to complain about Mr Sandland's teaching of sex education some three years early. I'll call this the eighth allegation. Mr. Ms Lovell assessed the situation and determined that there was no evidence of anything untoward occurring in the present. In June 1992, Mr Rooks, Mr Murray and Ms Lovell held a meeting with Mr Sandland to address concerns about the eighth allegation and him discussing matters of sexuality. <coughs> with children in the past. Mr Sandland said he may have been too direct in answering children's questions in this area and gave an undertaking not to do so in the future. A further meeting was held a week later in June 1992 at which it was determined that a second adult would need to be present in the classroom. The hearing will explore whether this was for the purpose of monitoring his behaviour or assisting with his failing eyesight and whether the supervision was provided. During the meeting, a further allegation arose that Sanderlands had breached the corporal punishment guidelines by punishing a female student. I'll call this the ninth allegation. The meeting accepted his plea of ignorance, although Mr Murray pointed out the corporal punishment guidelines had been announced at a staff meeting. Mr Sanderland's departure from the college. On 8th of October 1992, Pastor Smith sent a memorandum to Mr Rooks following the church board meeting two days earlier. 
In it, Pastor Smith indicated that he had interviewed Mr Sanderlands about his deteriorating eyesight and would have to determine his future in the light of the risk to children under his supervision and any resulting legal action. On 10th of November 1992, Pastor Smith wrote to Mr Sanderlands to inquire whether he had the intention of staying in the teaching system given his visual disability and asked for a comprehensive medical report. In the memorandum, he discussed a number of potential financial benefits that may be available to him should he leave teaching. On 5th of December 1992, Mr Rooks submitted a recommendation to Pastor Smith that Mr Sanderland's contract be reviewed in the light of a lack of confidence expressed by a number of parents, a concern for the safety of children, the raising of historical allegation and breach of guidelines, and the difficulty in him performing his duties. The evidence is likely to reveal that Mr Sanderland's went on sick leave at the end of 1992 due to his failing oversight. He resigned from his position at the college on 17th of February 1998. Further allegations after departure from the college. The evidence is likely to reveal that on 20th of November 1993, so a year later, the mother of AGE spoke with the college chaplain and provided an allegation to him. I'll call this the 10th allegation. She told him that AGE recalls sitting on Mr Sanderland's right knee. Sorry, knee. She rec I withdraw that. She told him that AGE recalls sitting on Mr Sanderland's knee eight years ago when she was in grade two, being touched on the hip and him moving towards her genital area and being asked, do you want more? On 23rd of November 1993, the father of AGC spoke with Ms Lovell and provided a complaint against Mr Sanderlands. I'll call these the 11th allegation. The allegation was that Mr Sanderlands had felt the genitals of AGC and another boy. Ms Lovell met with AGC's father, who provided her with allegations that included Mr Sanderlands touching the genitals of AGC on a number of occasions in Grade 2 and AGC seeing Mr Sandlands touch the genitals of a further four boys. Ms Lovell recommended to Mr Rooks that the allegations be taken seriously in the light of past allegations of a sexual nature and that AGC was unlikely to lie. <coughs> she indicated she would speak with Health and Community Services, the Victorian Department. On the 7th of December 1993, a Year 9 student, AGX, came forward to a teacher at the school and said that she had been molested by Mr Sanderlands. I'll call this the twelfth allegation. She said he had asked her to say he, she loved him and refused to talk to her if she did not. She also recalled Mr Sanderlands putting his legs tightly around her waist, pulling her close to him between his legs. In December 1993, the then principal of the college, Mr Rooks, now deceased, compiled a summary of allegations concerning Ken Sanderlands based on internal college reports between 1987 and 1993, which were available to him. Many, but not all of those documents are missing. The chronology sets out the knowledge of the principal at the time based on those records prior to any criminal or civil proceedings. On the 13th of December, 1993, Pastor Smith and Mr Rooks met with Mr Sanderlands and put the three new sets of allegations to him. Mr Sanderlands denied all of them and said he could not admit them in good conscience. Pastor Smith requested a written response from Mr Sanderlands to the allegation and, dependent on the information contained in Sanderlands' response, a recommendation was to be made to the board that parents be informed that the church had done all we can possibly do to ascertain the truth in this matter and be given an excerpt of Sanderland's letter. Pastor Smith also suggested that parents be invited to take the matter up with Mr Sanderland's themselves and that counselling would be offered to parents and their children. Two days later, Mr Sanderland's wrote a short letter saying that attitude to allowing children to sit on your knee had changed, that he had allowed children to do so but had not touched any children indecently. 
In his December 1993, January 1994 report for the Church Board, Pastor Smith stated that he had pursued the matter with the person concerned and had received a letter from him denying all allegations. Pastor Smith also stated that the three families had been notified of the outcome and he did not believe there was anything further he could do. Criminal proceedings. The evidence will indicate that on 17th of July 2000, Mr Sandlands was charged with 13 counts of indecent assault against both female and male students at the college during the period that he taught there. Statements were obtained by police from the victims, parents of the victims and staff members of the college as part of the criminal proceedings in 2000. On 22nd of November 2000, Mrs Sandlands pleaded guilty to 12 counts of indecent assault and was sentenced to two years imprisonment with a non-parole period of 12 months. Uh, earlier I said uh, th he pleaded guilty to 13 counts. I was in error. It was 12 counts of indecent assault. Mr Sanderlands appealed against the severity of his sentence but later withdrew the appeal. He commenced serving his sentence on the 7th of February 2001. On the same day that he was sentenced, Mr Sanderlands was deregistered from the registered school board in Victoria. Most recently, about a month ago, on the 10th of September 2014, Mr Sandland was convicted of a further six counts of indecently assault a girl and one count of indecently assault a male under 16 at St Paul's Anglican Primary School in Frankston, Victoria. Each of the offences occurred between 1970 and 1974, some 10 years before he commenced at the college. At the time of the offences, each of the complainants was aged about nine and was either in grade three or grade four. He was sentenced then to a further 26 months imprisonment. The hearing will explore whether those at Northside Christian Centre or the college were aware of any such allegations when Mr Sanderlands was employed in 1983. Civil proceedings. The evidence is likely to reveal that between 2000 and 2002, six victims of Mr Sanderlands commenced civil proceedings against Mr Sanderlands and the church. The plaintiffs in 2000 were AGA, AGC, who we've heard about, but also AGD, AGH, AGL and AGN. AGE commenced proceedings about two years later. Pastor Smith and Mrs Brown were named as defendants in the civil proceedings by four of the plaintiffs, and Mr Rooks was named as a fifth defendant by AGC. From at least the 1980s, the Assemblies of God has offered to broker public liability insurance for its affiliated church. That body was known as AOG Insurance Services, but is now known as Australian Christian Services. The church accepted the policy offered during the 1980s and received insurance from insurance company EIG Ansvar. In 1987, however, a change to the public liability cover brokered by AOG Insurance Services and accepted by the church excluded sexual molestation. The result was that the new insurance policy excluded AGC's claim, whilst the old coverage provided full or partial coverage for the other claimants. The church's lawyers advised that the, remain, the remaining amount had to be made up by Mr Sanderlands and the church. The evidence will reveal that Pastor Spinella, current senior pastor of the church, requested a financial contribution from the AOG in relation to the civil proceedings. The plaintiff's lawyers provided an initial estimate of the total damages of $1.8 million. The Assemblies of God declined to participate in the mediation process, despite invitation, or provide financial support to the church. Keith Ainge, the National Ministries Director of the Assemblies of God, wrote to the church's legal representatives on 12th of December 2001 to advise that all churches with the AO ship, within the AOG fellowship are autonomous and are responsible for their own affairs. The evidence will also reveal that the national executive of the AOG met on the 2nd to the 4th of April 2002 and agreed that we cannot take any responsibility for the claims against the church without creating a dangerous precedent. 
The evidence will also reveal that mediation between the church, the insurer and the victims began in September 2001 and the settlement amount was reached for five of the six plaintiffs in October 2001. It was agreed that a total amount of $525,000 would be divided between the five plaintiffs. The church contributed around 27% to the settlement, Ansvar Insurance contributed 33% and Mr Sanderlands contributed 40%. In December 2001, a further settlement was agreed with respect to AGC's proceedings in the amount of $35,000, and the church contributed 53% to the final settlement. It is anticipated that seven people will give evidence to the Royal Commission in respect of the Northside Christian College in this case study. AGA will give evidence of her abuse by Mr Sanderlands and the response of the college and the church to her disclosures. She will be followed by Margaret Furlong, a former teacher from the college, who received a number of allegations, including those from AGA. The Royal Commission will then hear evidence from Kerry Lovell, who was a teacher and school counsellor at the college, and involved in assessing a number of <coughs> allegations against Mr Sanderlands. Former Deputy Principal of the college, Simon Murray, will then give evidence. He will be followed by Reverend Dennis Smith, the chair of the church board during Mr Sanderlands' period of employment at the college. Pastor John Spinello will also be called. He joined the church in 1987 and then the college council in 1992. He has been the, the church's senior pastor since 1998. Finally, Shane Baxter, the Victorian state president of the ACC, will give evidence regarding the role of the ACC in responding to disclosures of sexual abuse at an affiliated church. Sunshine Coast and Jonathan Baldwin. The third part of the public hearing will consider the response of the ACC to child sexual abuse by Jonathan Baldwin between 2004 and 2006 at a Queensland church. During those years, Mr, Do Mr Baldwin was the youth pastor at a ch church we will call the Sunshine Coast Church. Sexual, section 10 of the Criminal Law Sexual Offences Act 1978 of Queensland prevents the publication of the name of a place which might identify the victim of child sexual abuse. The Sunshine Coast Church was affiliated with the ACC. During 2004 and 2006, the senior pastor at the church was Ian Lehman, who at the end of 2005 became Mr Baldwin's father-in-law. ALA attended the Sunshine Coast Church with his two brothers and his parents. He had contact with Mr Baldwin in his position as youth pastor. The sexual abuse occurred between 2004 and 2006 when ALA <coughs> was between the ages of 13 and 15 and happened on and off church premises. The evidence is likely to reveal that Mr Baldwin impressed ALA when they first met and the two spent much time together. ALA was having problems at home and turned to Mr Baldwin for guidance and counselling. The two became increasingly close and the sexual contact started in 2004 with genital touching at a sleepover for young parishioners. The evidence will show that in 2005, the sexual contact increased to mutual masturbation, oral sex and one episode of sodomy. Anal intercourse then occurred very frequently until the end of that year. There were further sexual acts just before and after Mr Baldwin's marriage at the end of 2005. The district court who later heard the case described Mr Baldwin's actions as manipulative and exploitative of ALA as the relationship involved progressively more serious sexual misconduct. In early 2006, Mr Baldwin and his wife moved to the Gold Coast and he became the youth pastor at another church. In June 2006, Senior Pastor Ian Lehman also left the Sunshine Coast Church and was replaced by Senior Pastors Christian and Carol Peterson. ALA made allegations of sexual abuse to the police in 2007 and Mr Baldwin was arrested later that year and charged. Documentary evidence is likely to show that Mr Baldwin strenuously denied the charges and sought the payment of his legal fees by the Sunshine Coast Church's insurer. 
On 6 of December 2007, <coughs> the Queensland State Executive ACC noted that Mr Baldwin had been charged and that he must surrender his credential. Some days later, he did so. The hearing will explore the steps taken to suspend and remove credentials of pastors. Mr Baldwin's criminal trial took place at Maroochydore in October 2008 and he was convicted by a jury on 22nd of March 2009 of one count of maintaining, eight counts of indecent treatment of a child under 16 and one count of sodomy. In March 2009, he was sentenced to eight years imprisonment with a non-parole period of four years. He lodged an appeal of his conviction but was unsuccessful. He is no longer in jail. The hearing will explore what support was provided by the Sunshine Coast Church and the ACC to ALA and his family during the criminal pr process and what he and his family were told of the process concerning <coughs> suspension of Mr Baldwin, removal of his credentials and the possibility of compensation. The evidence is likely to reveal that after Baldwin was convicted, Pastor Peterson offered on behalf of the Sunshine Coast Church to pay for professional counselling support. In May 2009, ALA's father emailed Pastor Peterson and asked for his help for what he described as, quote, the deafening silence from the AOG, close quote. He said, and I quote, are the leadership concerned about the victim at all? A young man actively involved in their church has been seriously wounded through all of this, end quote. He asked whether the ACC had any processes in place to address these matters and asked why not a word had been heard from the ACC a month after sentencing of Baldwin. The hearing will explore what steps were taken in response to this email by the Sunshine Coast Church and the ACC. The evidence is likely to show that two years later, ALA's father remained frustrated <coughs> with the apparent lack of action by the ACC. He wrote an email on 11th of October 2011 to a large number of people, many from the Christian community. He wrote, and I quote, Jesus said, suffer the little ones to come unto me. We brought our little ones to him, and now our youngest suffers and suffers and suffers. For eight years now he has suffered. Firstly, the abhorrent abuse from what should have been a safe place. Secondly, the painfully protracted and difficult legal process that finally saw his tormentor put away. And now the ongoing struggles as he wrestles with the ongoing mental torment caused by what he has been through and as he seeks some form of compensation for all he has and continues to suffer." Quote. The state clerk of the ACC in Queensland replied the next day as follows, and I quote, we recently received your email and we are not sure if this is a legitimate email or spam. If this is a leg legitimate email and you wish to discuss the contents of the email further, please do not hesitate to contact us." End quote. Gary Svensson, the State Ministries Director of the ACC in 2011, is likely to give evidence that following the father's email, he reviewed the matter and noted that there was no record of the ACC being advised of the conviction until 2011. By that time, negotiations were underway between ALA and the insurer. The insurance claims officer suggested in an email to Mr Svensson that the ACC explain to ALA's father about the policies for dealing with such matters, including the withdrawal of credentials and the protection of victims. The hearing will explore whether those suggestions were accepted by the ACC and what steps, if any, were taken by the ACC concerning the father's concerns. By April 2012, ALA's family had made contact with the National Secretary of the ACC, Pastor Sean Stanton. The evidence is likely to show that a decision was made by the national and state presidents to have Mr Svensson visit ALA's family in regional Western Australia where they were then living. He travelled to where the family was living and had a six hour meeting with ALA's parents and then ALA in August 2012. Mr Svensson is likely to give evidence that he reported that the family's pain and grief over the abuse and subsequent journey concerning ALA was very evident. 
and that they had felt completely abandoned and without support from the movement. Mr Svensson is likely to say he told <coughs> the parents that, quote, there is no justification for a lack of support from ACC to the family, end quote. He explained the policies and procedures of the ACC and said that the family appeared to feel reassured. In his report, which will be tendered, he identifies certain failings at the AOG. First, he says that the senior pastor failed to take action when serious concerns were expressed to him by a church member because he was Mr Baldwin's father-in-law. Second, the new senior pastor of the Sunshine Coast Church did not advise the state executive of the matter, including the conviction. Three, the ACC failed to monitor the legal processes, including the outcome of the criminal proceedings, and consequently failed to support the family. He recommends that in future, such matters should remain on the state executive's agenda until all necessary action by ACC is completed. The public hearing will explore action by the state and national executives of the ACC during the period 2009 to 2012 to advise ALA and his family of the policies and processes <coughs> to be followed, to provide support to the family and to take steps to discipline senior pastor Lehman. The hearing will also hear evidence of whether the relevant policies regarding child sexual abuse and related matters were followed by the state and national executives of the ACC. The evidence will also reveal that in 2012, ALA settled his civil claim concerning Mr Baldwin's sexual abuse of him. It is anticipated that the Royal Commission will hear evidence from four individuals in relation to the Sunshine Coast Church in this case study. Firstly, Ian Lehman and Christian Peterson, the former pastors of the Sunshine Coast Church. It is also expected that the Royal Commission will hear evidence from present employees of the ACC regarding their role in responding to disclosures of child sexual abuse at the Sunshine Coast Church. Gary Svensson is currently the State Ministries Director for Queensland and the Northern Territory, and John Hunt is the current Queensland State President of the ACC. Finally, it is expected that Wayne Alcorn, the current national president of the ACC, will give evidence before the Royal Commission in this case study. Mr Alcorn will give evidence regarding the current policies and procedures of the ACC. That concludes the opening. Thank you, Mr Beckett. Uh, we will perhaps take a short break. You're about to call the first witness. I am. Yes. Just a moment before we do that, and I omitted to... Um, confirm that it's Commissioner Atkinson and I that will be sitting on this public hearing. And for those um, not familiar with the sitting times of the Commission, I should just confirm that apart from that disruption this morning, um, normal starting time will be 10am, a mid-morning break at around uh, 11.30, depending on where the hearing room is uh, with respect to witnesses. Uh, lunch adjournment between 1 and 2, uh, resume at 2 and sit until 4 on each day. <clears throat> and I do remind um, Council we are live streaming these proceedings and for those members of Council uh, not familiar with um, the live streaming process, uh, it is necessary to acknowledge um, both your name and who you're appearing for at each um, stage when you get to your feet to um, ask questions of any of the witnesses to ensure that as best as can be those who are watching remotely are able to understand who's speaking at any given time. Um, and uh, I'll endeavour to keep on reminding um, members of council. Uh, just one final thing for those members of the gallery uh, watching the proceedings in here. Um, you are free to move in and out of the hearing room uh, as you wish, but I ask only of you that um, you please do that as uh, quietly as possible. It uh, can prove quite disruptive for a witness in the witness box, so please just... Um, uh, have some understanding of that and make sure that you do so, causing the least disruption. 
So otherwise, we'll take a short adjournment, um, 10 minutes, and resume at 12 with the first witness. Mr Beckett, thank you.
I call AHA. <laughs> AHA, would you like to take the oath or the affirmation? I'll take an affirmation, Your Honour. Thank you. Could you repeat after me, please? I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. In this Royal Commission. In this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Just take a seat right where you are, please, and uh, Mr Beckett will have some questions for you. Mr A <coughs> Mr AHA, um, we've um, given you a pseudonym in this matter, and so I'll be referring to you as Mr AHA. Um, now, you've provided your address to the Royal Commission, is that correct? Yes. And, um, in, and your current occupation is as a disability pensioner, is that right? Yes. And you provided a statement to the Royal Commission dated the 30th of September 2014, is that right? Yes. And um, do you have any amendments to that statement? Yes, on uh, the paragraph 12, I just would like to change a, a date, please. Yes, what would you like to change it to? Uh, the 3rd of November 1998. All right. Uh, 3rd of November 1998. Uh, are there any other changes you wish to make to, the, to your statement? Not, not that I'm aware of. Um, is, the, is the statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes. I tender the statement. So it will be um, Exhibit 18.001. Your Honour, I should have this time tender the, um, the documents with respect to um, the Hillsong part of the public hearing. I'm sorry to interrupt this witness to do so, but I think uh, it's probably easiest if I do so now rather than in the middle of this evidence. Um, Your Honour, uh, <coughs> we'll have... And um, those at the bar table have a copy of what we've referred to as the Hillsong documents. It's a, a small volume of material. Um, so I'll choose this, op choose this opportunity to, to tender the entirety of that volume. So I'll have that marked as Exhibit 18.002. Now, Mr AHA, um, I wonder if you could uh, please read your statement out to the Royal Commission. I'll do my best. This statement made by me accurately sets out the evidence that I'm prepared to give to the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse. The statement is true and correct to the best of my knowledge and belief. Where direct speech is referred to in this statement is provided in words or words to the effect of which those were you, which were used to the best of my recollection. Paragraph four. In or about the late 1960s, my family were quite heavily involved in the Assemblies of God Church, the AOG. My family were personal friends with Pastor Frank Houston, Pastor Frank, and his family. Pastor Frank lived in New Zealand, however, he frequently visited Australia to preach and conduct religious seminars. By the late 1970s, he was also setting up the church, Sydney Christian Life Centre, Sydney CLC, in Sydney. Sydney CLC first started as open air meetings in a scout hall in Double Bay and quickly evolved into Sydney CLC headquarters on Oxford Street. Sydney CLC later merged with Hills Christian Life Centre to become Hills CLC to become Hillsong Church. About 1969 or 1970, Pastor Frank would stay with my family in Coogee, New South Wales, every now and again when he came to Australia. This was about seven, I was about seven or eight years old at the time. 
His son, Brian, who was in his mid-teens, also stayed with us on one or two occasions. Brian and I would play together at Coogee Beach when they would come and stay with us. Pastor Frank's other son, Graham, would also stay sometimes. Pastor Frank's wife would sometimes visit, but she didn't stay. In January 1970, I recall that Pastor Frank and his son, Brian, stayed with us for almost a whole week. I'm aware of the date because Pastor Frank signed and dated my mother's Bible, 1970, which she still has, and this is the day before my birthday. A photocopy of the signed Bible is attached to this statement. Pastor Frank was a popular preacher, and during his visit from New Zealand, he didn't just preach at one church, but visited many different churches. My family would often go to the different churches with him. We would go and see him before or after the meeting, and he would hug and kiss me in front of other people. We would sometimes go into an office alone where he would fill between my legs. I remember, I remember this happening at an evangelical camp at Windsor. On this trip, Pastor Frank and Brian were staying in my sister's room, which has a bunk bed, while my sister stayed in my parents' room. I had a room to myself that was walled off part of our veranda. Pastor Frank would creep into my room late at night, nearly every night of the week. I would be asleep when he came in, and then I would wake up with him standing over me. I remember that when he was touching me inappropriately, I would be petrified and would lay very still. I could not speak while this was happening and felt like I couldn't breathe. I'm not sure how long he would stay in the room with me, but it felt like forever. I know that he left when it was still full dark. The abuse in my home and at the different church meetings continued over a period of years until I reached puberty. Pastor Frank wanted nothing to do with me after I reached puberty. I continued to attend Sydney CLC regularly after the abuse stopped. I usually attended every Sunday. I can't recall when I stopped attending church, but my attendance slowly filtered away as I wasn't keen on being too close to Pastor Frank. On occasions, I would still see him at the back of the church and he would come up and hug me. The first disclosure of abuse. I was so ashamed of the abuse that I kept it inside for many years and did not tell anyone. It, it was only on or about 1978, when I was about 16 years old, that I told my mother about the abuse. My mother was still heavily involved in the church at that time, and I observed that it was difficult for her to accept what I told her. All of her friends were involved in the church, and the Houstons were considered to be almost like royalty in those circles. Pastor Frank was a very popular character and everyone wanted to go to his church in those days. After I told her about the abuse, my mother said words to the following effect, you don't want to be responsible for turning people from the church and sending them to hell. My mother's response affected me and made me think that I did not want to cause any trouble. I therefore did not pursue the matter any further. Disclosure of abuse to the church. On or about September 1999, my mother attended a church meeting at Emmanuel Christian Family Church at Plumpton, New South Wales. Mr. AHA, I'll just stop you there. Is that the date you changed or are you oh. reverting to September 1989? Yes, it was a bit further back. I'm sorry about that. Um, I haven't adjusted it on my form here. What, but, is, the, what is the correct date at the start of paragraph 12? Uh, it was November the 3rd, 1998. Thank you. Please Sorry. Conti please continue. My mother attended a church meeting at Emmanuel Christian Family Church in Plumpton, New South Wales. The church is an AOG church. Pastor Barbara Taylor, Pastor Taylor ran the church and was holding an outreach meeting. Pastor Taylor took over the running of the church. Pastor Kevin Mudford, Pastor Mudford, was also present at the outreach meeting. 
My mother called me and told me she had a conversation with Pastor Mudford and told him that I had been sexually abused by Pastor Frank. She warned me that Pastor Mudford was on his way to my home. She said words to the following effect, he's coming round there, he's very aggressive, he's very angry at you. Shortly thereafter, Pastor Mudford came to my home and started pounding on the front door. I believe it was a Sunday morning when these events took place. When I opened the door, he proceeded to shout at me in a very aggressive manner. He shouted words to the effect that I had made up the story about Pastor Frank. Pastor Mudford then barged through the front door. Pastor Taylor arrived as Pastor Mudford was getting ready to leave my house, as I wanted him out. Both Pastor Taylor and Pastor Mudford questioned me about the allegations I had made against Pastor Frank. They tried to tell me that I, what I was saying was not true and they both said words to the following effect. Frank Houston couldn't have done that, he's a good man. However, I got the impression that Pastor Taylor believed my story to some degree by the end of our conversation. She said that she would speak to the church hierarchy on my behalf and get back to me about it. On or about the 16th of September 1999, about a week after Pastors Taylor and Mudford had come to my house, I received a letter from Pastor Taylor. Pastor Taylor stated in her letter to me that she had seen Pastor John McMartin, an executive member of the AOG, and that Pastor McMartin had said that the AOG have a structure in place that can and will deal with allegations of child sexual abuse if they have a written accusation with the time and place. The letter also said, the secular courts is not the way. And she encouraged me to go to the church with my story as the church would give me fair hearing. Although Pastor Taylor told Pastor McMartin of the AOG my story, I never received any correspondence or communication directly from anyone at Sydney CLC. Hillsong or from anyone in the AOG hierarchy itself about this matter. The only conduct I had was from, past, from, from Pastor Frank himself who started calling me and my mother on a regular basis. The phone call started coming about a week or two after I received the letter of the 16th of December 99 from Pastor Taylor. I received several phone calls from Pastor Frank over different periods. When he called me, he would say words to the following effect, I want to get together to discuss some sort of money as a compensation to you. I don't want this on my head when I stand in front of God. The money was something that he brought up. It wasn't something that I asked him for. I eventually agreed to meet Pastor Frank on or about early 2000. I decided to meet him because of his phone calls as I didn't want to hear from him any longer and just wanted to get it over and done with. The meeting at Redfern Station in Sydney, I attended that meeting, but when I saw Pastor Frank pull up in his green Jaguar, I walked away. Seeing him bothered me and I did not want to be anywhere near him. Even being in the same state as him bothered me and I just didn't want to connect with him. Following the new meeting at Redfern Station, Pastor Frank continued to attempt to make contact with me and my mother. When he called me, he would say words to the following effect, look, we need to meet, I want to organise some money for you, some compensation and get this off. On or about late 2000, whilst Pastor Frank was still active in the church, I agreed to meet with him. The meeting was held at McDonald's Restaurant at Thornlea, just up the Pennant Hills Road. When I arrived at McDonald's, I saw Pastor Frank's green Jaguar in the car park. Inside the restaurant, I saw Pastor Frank sitting down next to a man whom I did not recognise, the unnamed man. The unnamed man was eating a burger. Pastor Frank said words <clears> to <throat> the following effect, I want your forgiveness for this. I don't want to die and have to face God with this on my head. The unnamed man then put a food stained napkin down in front of me and said words Words were said to the following effect, the unnamed man, if you put your signature there, I'll give you the 10,000. Pastor Frank, just do it and say you forgive me and that'll be it. At this stage, I was nearly going into a panic. I just wanted to get away from the whole situation. I signed the napkin. The unnamed man said words to the following effect, all right, 
I'll be in touch, I'll send you a check. Pastor Frank then said words to the following effect. If there's any problem, contact me or Brian and you'll get your money. I left the restaurant after that. About two months after my meeting with Pastor Frank at McDonald's, I telephoned Brian Houston as I had not yet received any money from Pastor Frank. We had a conversation to the following effect. Me, what's happening with the payment I was promised? I agreed to forgive your father. Brian, yes, OK, I'll get the money to you. There's no problem. You know it's your fault all of this happened. You tempted my father. Me, why did he molest you also? Brian got very angry after that. He slammed the phone down after saying words to the effect of, you'll be getting money. I'm certain that Brian Houston knew about the meeting that I had with Pastor Frank at McDonald's. I did not tell him about the meeting during our phone call conversation. However, he appeared to be aware of it, and I therefore assumed that Pastor Frank had discussed it with him. Pastor Frank had also told me I could call Brian Houston if there was a problem, so that made me believe that Pastor Frank would speak to Brian about the agreement made at McDonald's. About half a month later, a cheque in the sum of 10000 arrived in the post. There was no correspondence of any sort with the cheque, and I cannot recall who the drawer of the cheque was. On or about 2000, I was watching Brian Houston deliver a Hillsong sermon on television. Brian Houston was very emotional and teary-eyed, and he said to the congregation words to the following effect, I would like you all to pray for me and my family. My father has been involved in a minor indiscretion that happened 30 years ago in New Zealand, and we would just like you to pray for us. I knew this to be a reference to allegations that I had read online that Pastor Frank had sexually abused a child or children 30 years ago while he was working with the Salvation Army in New Zealand. I was appalled <clears throat> that Brian Houston had not revealed the extent of the allegations against his father including my more recent story of abuse by him in Australia. He avoided using the word pedophilia or anything like that. I thought it was corrupt that he had used the phrase involved in a minor indiscretion to describe Pastor Frank's conduct. As far as I was aware, Pastor Frank was still preaching on and off at this time and was also doing seminars. On or around 2000, Brian Houston was featured on ABC's Australian Story and he said that his father would step down from preaching. I'm not aware of the exact time, but sometime between the years 2000 and 2004, my mother told me that Brian Houston had telephoned her. The reason I know it was between these years, as it was after the time that everything started to become public in 2000, but before Pastor Frank's memorial service in November 2004. My mother told me that Brian Houston had said words to the following effect. It's terrible what happened to AHA, but the church has to come first. My father never molested me. As far as I'm aware, the police were never involved in this matter and Hillsong did not notify any external authorities about the allegations against Pastor Frank. <clears throat> the effects of abuse... I feel that what Pastor Frank did to me destroyed my childhood. What he did to me and what he made me do has had a bad reflection on me for the rest of my life. For many years I was full of shame and fear and embarrassment. Now I feel mostly anger. The abuse has had long-term effects on me. Late in the night I still get flashbacks of Pastor Frank in my bedroom and see his face floating around me. <coughs> I have difficulties being in the presence of elderly men. I also have difficulty in being intimate with my wife. I can't relate to my own children. I find it awkward to hug my own sons because I don't want them getting used to another male hugging them. Emotionally, I don't feel close to anyone and I feel like I'm dead and emotionless on the inside. I'm currently suffering from depression and post-traumatic stress syndrome. I am on a disability pension. My doctor has diagnosed the cause of these illnesses as Pastor Frank's abuse. I feel very isolated when my story first started to come out and the church community made me feel like I was the problem. 
No one believed my story and others put pressure on me to keep my mouth shut. I felt that the church's response was completely inadequate and I have received absolutely no support, no counselling, apology or acknowledgement of the abuse. I believe that Brian Houston and the other elders of the Hillsong Church kept Pastor Frank's history as quiet as they could and they have not been held accountable for how they have handled my allegation. I have some questions I wanted to ask you about um, your statement. Uh, <clears throat> if I can go first to paragraphs 7 and 8. Um, in paragraph 8, you refer to uh, Pastor Frank coming into your room when he was staying over in your family house and uh, touching you inappropriately that you would be petrified and would just lay st very still. Um, I want to ask you about that occasion in particular. Yes. Do you understand that? Yes. Yes. Um, now, I'll ask you just some, just some brief questions about that. Um, and um, if, if you need to stop at any time, just uh, say so. Um, first of all, um, on the occasion that you recount there, did um, Mr Houston come into your room and lie on top of you? Correct. Um, did he place his hand or hands on your genitals? Yes, he did. Um, did he place a finger into your anus on that occasion? Yes, he did. Um, um, did Pastor Frank masturbate you on that occasion? Yes, he did. Um, did Pastor Frank engage in any form of oral sex with you? I can't recall, sir. All right. Um, <clears throat> and did that abuse or abuse of that nature take place on one occasion or on a number of occasions? On a number of occasions. Um, at about that time or on other dates? The well? worst of it was about that time, but it continued on. All right. And how long was uh, Pastor Frank staying with you and your family on that occasion that you recount in paragraph 8? That was the week after the... Uh, the uh, evangel evangelical camps at Windsor. They came and stayed with us for the one full week after that as per signature in Mum's Bible. And how many times did um, abuse in the nature that you've described occur during that week? Mostly every night that I can recall. Um, and then after that week, were there further episodes where the abuse took place? Yes. Um. <clears throat> And over what sort of period was that? Over the next couple of years, as I went to visit him and uh, other churches, um, he would call me aside into his office and further things would take place and um, hugging and kissing and it just continued. All right. Um, now, it's a long time ago, but when you told your mother in 1978 mm -hmm. about, about the abuse, um, did you indicate to her it had you had been abused on one occasion or multiple occasions? I just, from what I can remember, is that what I'd said to her was that he had abused me. Right. <clears throat> now, you, you say that uh, on or about the 3rd of November, your mother was attending a church meeting at Emmanuel Christian Family Church in Plumpton and disclosed to somebody there um, the abuse that had happened to you when you were um, aged about... I think seven or eight, is that right? That's correct. Yes. All right. And... Um, as far as you know, was that was that uh, was that dis disclosed to Pastor Taylor or to Pastor Mudford or to both of them at that stage? From what I know, it was both. All right. 
and Pastor Mudford came round to your place. Is that correct? Yes. That day or the next day, or when did he do that? I think it was in a very short period. It could have been the same day or the day following. All right. And... You've set out what he says in paragraph 14, and then um, on the same occasion, so when Pastor Mudford was there speaking with you about the abuse in your house, Pastor Taylor also arrived, is that right? Yes. And you say that you got the impression that Pastor Taylor <coughs> believed your story to some degree, is that right? I just don't think that anyone wanted to believe that Pastor Frank could do such a thing. Um, and, and then you say she said that she would speak to the church hierarchy on my behalf and get back to me about it. Do you see that? Barbara Taylor. Yes. Did she say who she was going to speak to? Senior executives in the uh, AOGs. Uh, the state or national executive? Or? That, that was about all I understood. And um, did she come back to you at about that time and tell you that she had taken the matter to the church hierarchy? Yes, after a period of time she had informed me that she'd spoken to them. All yes. Right. Now, um, Pastor Taylor tells us that she spoke to um, um, a man by the name of... Uh, John McMartin, who was on the state executive... Yes. ..at about that time. Um, did she tell you that she had spoken to uh, Pastor McMartin? From memory, I can't recall exactly. What did you understand the process was for the consideration of, of your um, allegation of abuse? <clears throat> Well, I didn't know there was going to be anything. As far as I understood it, she was going to speak to them on my behalf and the letter came forward and then nothing but deafening silence. That was it. All right, so the letter you're referring to is the one in September of 1999, is that right? Yes. All right, well, we'll come to that in a moment. Um, Did you receive, before you received that letter on the 16th of September 1999, had you received any other contact apart from Pastor Taylor about the, um, about the, the consideration of your abuse? No. Um, what had you said to, if anything, to Pastor Taylor about whether you wanted the matter kept confidential um, or your name disclosed? <clears throat> the way it came out... I was completely embarrassed and felt ashamed and uh, I, I was hoping that no more would come of it. I was reluctant and I didn't want any more of it. It was uh, something that I was completely ashamed about. And uh, clearly that Pastor Taylor was considering taking the matter to um, the hierarchy, to the executive of the Assemblies of God. Did you give, you give her any instructions about revealing your name or the nature of the abuse or the perpetrator to her? Not that I can recall, sir. Um, we know that uh, Pastor Taylor had, a, on the basis of her evidence, had a number of conversations with, uh, with Pastor McMartin but didn't reveal until about... 10 or so months later, your name and the name of the perpetrator, namely Frank Houston. Were you, were you aware of that? No. Uh, <clears throat> now, after... After the 16th of September 1999 letter, this is the one from Barbara Taylor to you. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> 
Uh, yes. Before I get to that, um, I understand certainly from um, Pastor Taylor's notes that um, you had spoken to a chamber magistrate um, about the abuse. Is that right? From what I can recall, I went to a did. It wasn't the chamber magistrate. It was a, a, a solicitor's. And I went in and started to speak to them about some of the allegations. At that point, I broke down and um, uncontrollably, and um, I left the office straight away. I couldn't stand going through it. It just, could, it just my, my felt like my nerves were completely smashed. Did you receive any advice from the solicitor about it? It never went any further. All right. Now, um, I'll just have you shown a copy of the letter of the 16th of September, 1999. Uh, tender bundle tab two. If you just scroll down, you'll see that at the start there that um, she's written to you, that is Barbara Taylor has written to you alerting you to the fact that she had spoken to John McMartin on the 16th of September 1999. Do you see that? Yes. And uh, you received this letter? Yes. Yes. Um, and she advised that she had been told Pastor John McMartin had a structure in place to deal with the, the abuse allegations. Do you see that? Yes, sir. And she says that um, she, she, she understands that you will be fairly dealt with as a result of this process. Do you see that? Yes, sir. And then in the next paragraph it says... The secular courts is not the way I believe to go, but to the church where I believe you will receive a fair hearing. I will stand with you, Brett, for I believe you. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Um, had you had some contact... Sorry, I'll draw that. Had you had some conversation with Pastor Taylor before that time about going to the secular courts? No, sir, I don't think so. Um, were you considering at that time going to the police or going to um, the civil courts to sue Frank Houston? It didn't come. It didn't occur to me to do that. No. I... All right. What What did you understand by that paragraph? The secular courts is not the way. Well, the secular courts, as far as I understood it, then was the the, the courts of the earth. And being so heavily involved in the church, we looked at the to the church for direction. And um, and as it reads further along, that the church will give me a fair, fair hearing, and that's the way we seem to be uh, programmed to deal with these problems. So we went to the church. The secular courts and the police was something that um, that was for the unbelievers. And. After you received this letter of the 16th of September 1999, did you have any contact with Pastor John McMartin? None at all. Did you have any contact with anybody else from the Assemblies of God um, about your abuse allegations? Nothing. Now, I want to ask you about contact with, with Frank Houston. Do you recall whether you received any contact from Frank Houston directly? There were lots of phone calls coming in from Frank Houston. All right. To, to you, to somebody else? To, my, to myself and to my mother. All right. And when did... Sorry, you say in paragraph 17 that the phone calls started coming about a week or two after you received the letter of 16th of September 1999. Is that right? They were actually before that. There were frequent phone calls coming up before that letter was uh, I received any copy of it. All right. How did you? How did Frank Houston come to um, have your phone number? To your knowledge, I have no idea. I think he, he re, uh, phoned my mother, and she'd given it to him for him to go further in conversations with me. All right. And what was the nature of these telephone calls? that he wanted to get together with me. He uh, was very frightened with what he'd been doing to myself and to other children, and he didn't want to die and go with this uh, in front of God to answer for it. He was very fearful. So did you, um, what did he say firstly about um, your allegations of abuse? 
Did he admit them? Did he deny them? What did he say about them? He just went straight into, like, we've got to get together and seek compensation and I want you to forgive me so I can stand in front of God. That seemed to be the main two things. He wasn't concerned about me personally. It just seemed to be more about himself and protecting himself. And then so if he died, he could stand in front of God and say that he was absolved of it. Um, you mentioned other allegations against Frank Houston. Um, was there some discussion of other allegations? Nothing at all. What did he say about any other allegations? Nothing. Did he mention them or did you mention them to him? Nothing, and he never said anything to me about them. Now, <clears throat> there was some discussion of a form of financial compensation to you for the abuse. Is that right? Yes, sir. Um, how did that conversation... How, sorry, withdraw that. How did that issue come to be discussed? Did you put it to him? Did he put it to you? How did it come about? No, he came straight out with it and just said, we need to get together. We need to deal with this. Um, and I wanted to discuss some sort of form of compensation for you. And then, so again, the same statement that he, so we can stand in front of God and not have this on his head. Had, had you met with him at that stage? No, though at the early days it was only just phone conversations. All right. Now, was there... Um, did you receive any payment as a result of those conversations? The first payment I, I, I can recall was that he was, we were supposed to meet at Redfern Station, as I stated in my statement. Um, I didn't meet with him, but later on uh, that money appeared into my account and he'd been on the phone to me after that because he was very concerned that why we'd, we, we couldn't get together. How had he obtained uh, your account number to put the money into it? In conversations, he asked me for it. If... All right. And, but that doesn't seem to have been the end of the money. Is that right? No, sir. Um, he, in, uh, in a phone call to my mother, he said he would pay $2,000 a month till the day he died... Uh, I think that was his attempt to cover his trail, in my personal belief. And then the phone calls kept coming after that, uh, and that's when he made the remark that we need to get together and sort this out. And that's where the, the McDonald's restaurant uh, situation came to light. All right, and that's the occasion where there was uh, an apparent agreement to, um, to pay you $10,000. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And what did Pastor Frank want from you? Um, during that meeting? He wanted me to forgive him. All right. Um, what else did he say about um, the, the $10,000 and what it was compensation for? He just... Uh, him and the unnamed man basically were pushing me just to sign this piece of paper and to say that, provided I forgive him, uh, the money's yours. That was, that was the only connection to it. That was what he wanted. All right. Was there... You say he, um, you were asked to, by the unnamed man to sign a food-stained napkin, is that right? Yes. Um, was, there, was there a document, like a typed document, that was put in front of you? No. Um, did you subsequently sign some form of agreement, written agreement? There was nothing, as far as I could tell, on the napkin. And at that stage, sir, I just want to tell you that I was in a state of panic. But as I could not see anything on it, I just scribbled my name on it and Frank kept badgering me about the forgiveness. All right. And as a result... Uh, sorry, there's one step further. Um, then I understand that there was some delay in receiving the money. Is that right? Yes, sir. And you spoke with Brian Houston about the money. Is that right? Yes. Was that the first time you'd spoken to Brian Houston? As far as I can recollect, sir, yes. And as a result of that, sorry, I withdraw that, um, and you say in your statement that as far as you were aware, he seemed to know that um, money had been offered to you by his father. Yes. Um, and... You say half a month later, a cheque in the sum of $10,000 arrived in the post. 
Yes. Um, now, do you, sorry, I'll withdraw that. Um, the what did you understand you were to do, if anything, as a result of receiving the ten thousand dollars? I have no idea. Was Forgiveness to Frank was what the ten thousand was for, yeah. and um, I have no idea what the rest of it was to go with. Uh, now, Pastor Taylor had mentioned going to the secular courts. Did uh, the receipt of the ten thousand dollars have any effect upon you going to either the police or the civil courts? To me, I felt that I was I gotten ten thousand dollars, and I was I just was going to stop at that because. I was deeply ashamed and upset with what had taken place and I didn't want to have any more to do with it. Did uh, During those telephone conversations or the meeting with Frank Houston, um, did he refer you to anybody at the Assemblies of God at the state executive or national executive level? No. Um, when you spoke to Brian Houston, did he refer you to the state or national executive? No. Um, after you spoke to him, did um, you receive any communication from Brian Houston asking you to go and speak with somebody at the state or national executive? No. Uh, uh, as you may know, Mr Houston, sorry, Pastor Houston has given a statement to the Royal Commission and he says that he first became aware of the allegations in late October and he says that about that time that you had a conversation with him <clears throat> in which you said to him, I don't want to go public, I don't want to go to the police, I don't want my identity public. Does that sound became aware of the allegations in late October? And he says that about that time that you had a conversation with him <clears throat> in which... You said to him, I don't want to go public, I don't want to go to the police, I don't want my identity public. Does that sound correct or incorrect to you? What is incorrect about it? I don't recall the call at, what, at any stage whatsoever. All right. Um, so it's incorrect because you can't remember it or you think it's unlikely you said it? It is unlikely. Why, why is it unlikely? Because the things that he would have said in it, I had very little to do with Brian Houston other than the statement that he gave before in regards to the money, uh, and I wanted nothing more to do with him. Um, did on, on that occasion when you spoke to him about the $10,000 that spoke to Brian Houston, did he offer you counselling? No. We have a note um, from the 21st of December 1999 um, from um, Pastor Barbara Taylor, who says she had a conversation with you about a phone call between you and Brian Houston. Do you understand that, first of all? Yes. Yes. In that note, she says that... Um, Brian Houston said to you, sorry, it's a bit convoluted, but she's recording something that she says you said to her. Okay. Do you understand that first yes, of all? Yes, sir. And she's recounting a conversation that you had with Brian Houston. Yes. Do you understand that? Yes. In that conversation, um, she records that Brian Houston was very defensive of his father. There was no counselling offered and that Brian questioned whether Frank was part of the Assemblies of God at the time of the abuse. Do you recall that at all? No, sir, I can't. Thank you. Yeah, just for the transcript reference, that's the, the note I'm referring to is an extra L to the statement of um, Barbara Taylor. Thank you. Now, 
Um, we have minutes of a national executive meeting dated the 22nd of December 1999, at which the national executive confirmed the suspension of Frank Houston's credentials. Do you understand that, first of all? Yes. At about that time, were you ever told that the matter had been considered by the national executive? No. Were you told after the December, after the December meeting about uh, the suspension of his credential? No. Were you told about a, a process of restoration or rehab rehabilitation for Frank Houston? I was told that they were concerned about him uh, as regards to this letter about the church praying for him and giving him healing ministry that he would stand and be, uh, be able to minister again and put this terrible thing behind him. Who told you that? It's in letter here, the, the exhibit here. I'll just clarify which exhibit you're referring to. Is it uh, Tender Bundle 3, the minutes of the Special Executive meeting of the 22nd of December 1999? Or... No, it's in this letter here. Um, it was just on. Um... KA1. All right, if Tab 2 can come back up. I trust Frank also confesses his awful deed, repents for sinning against God, receives forgiveness is disciplined and rises to a higher place in God because this blight on his character has been dealt with. I see. So this was, the, this was a letter you received from Barbara Taylor. Now, even though she was a pastor at an Assemblies of God church, she was not on the state or the national executive, was she? Not that I'm aware of. All right. So after this, after this letter, were you, or I should say after December of 1999, where the, when the decision happened, were you informed of the result of that meeting? Not really, no. I didn't know anything about it. All right. Now, um, were you aware that um, about November of 2000, a further national executive meeting was convened to consider allegations against Frank Houston? No. Were you aware that further allegations had come from New Zealand about him abusing children in that country? No. No. Um, in that year, that is between December 1999 and November 2000, had you had any contact with um, anybody from the state or national executive of the Assemblies of God? No. Had you received any counselling um, during that period of time from anybody or paid by uh, the Assemblies of God? No. Was the first time that you heard about... Frank Houston having his credential withdrawn when Brian Houston was speaking publicly? I think that was about the first time I'd heard anything about what disciplinary uh, measures that they'd taken against him. All right, so that was um, in paragraph 24 of your statement... Um, is that the first time that you heard about the allegations coming to light? Yes. And you say there, my father, that uh, Mr Houston had been involved in a minor indiscretion that happened 30 years ago in New Zealand. Do you see that? Yes. Was there any mention of, uh, or any description, vague or otherwise, of abuse of you by Brian Houston during that, sem that uh, sermon? No, sir. I was completely wiped like I didn't exist. All right. I see that um, in that, the quote that you've given there doesn't mention anything about Frank Houston's credential. When you heard that sermon, what did you understand had happened to Frank? Uh that he'd basically been disciplined, I think, to some degree. I didn't have much to... I didn't have any knowledge about it. My major uh, concern with that was just how my allegation was just completely just whitewashed. It was what didn't exist. It wasn't worth talking about. 
At the end of paragraph 24, you referred to Pastor Frank still preaching on and off at this time and was also doing seminars. Yes. Uh, do I take that to mean that your understanding was that effectively he was still um, preaching? Yes. In, in 2000. So I'm almost done, Your Honour, but uh, I noticed the time. Do you want to... Do you want to finish or take a break now, Mr. Um, I might take a break and come back and... Uh... So, Mr. AHA, you understand we're going to take the lunch adjournment now between 1 and 2. And Mr. Beckett's just indicating he just has a few more questions for you. And then the procedure is that I'll ask the other um, legal representatives here at the bar table as to whether or not they have any questions for you. OK. So we'll take
a pseudonym direction with respect to um, those people who are in column one of the pseudonym direction, which I'll hand up in a moment, and then a related direction not to publish those names as well. I hand up um, both the direction not to publish and the pseudonym direction. Yeah. Copies of both or draft orders have been <coughs> distributed to those at the bar table. Thank you. Yes, I'll make both of those orders. Thank you. Um, AHA, one, uh, one last matter, uh, if I could raise with you. I asked you earlier about discussions with... Uh, Pastor Barbara Taylor about going to the police. Um, at any stage during the period from um, when your mother passed the allegations on to Barbara Taylor and to Kevin Mudford through to 2000, <clears throat> did you have any discussions with anybody from the Assemblies of God um, about going to the police? No. No. Um, Was it, was it ever suggested to, to you that you should either go to the police or not go to the police by anybody from the Assemblies of God? No. And I'm, when I say the Assemblies of God, I mean the national executive or the state executive of the Assemblies of God? No. Yes, those, uh, those are my questions. Thank you, Mr Beckett. <coughs> Ms McGlinchey? Oh, might I go last? Yes, thank you. Mr Koenig. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, sir, my name is Aaron Kernigan, and I'm representing the person that you've referred to as Pastor Taylor. I have some questions for you which are by way of clarifying some of the things that you've said in your evidence today. The first question is in relation to what Council Assisting just asked you about information encouraging you or suggesting that you should go to the police or speak with law enforcement. During the course of your discussions with Pastor Taylor throughout 1998 and 1999, was it the case that you had discussions with her about going to the courts? No. Did you uh, have a discussion with her about seeking legal assistance? No. Did you indicate to her that you'd been to see a lawyer? No. The answers that you're giving now, do they come from a memory that you have of that time? Is it clear? It's not clear, no. Right. Um, in any event, it's possible that there was some sort of a discussion like that with Pastor Taylor. Would you agree with that? No, I wouldn't agree with that. All right. Was there a discussion with Pastor Taylor about the role that the church could play in dealing with the abuse that you had suffered in place of a court system? Basically, what was written in the letter was what was stated, not to go to the secular courts. Now that letter that you're referring to is the document that uh, you were shown, the letter to you dated the 16th of September 1999. Yes. Is that right? And the reference is... Uh, uh, Ending 001.0006. That document that is now in front of you on the screen. Yes. And in particular, the fourth paragraph down where it says the secular courts is not the way. Do you have any recollection about whether or not during the times that you spoke with Pastor Taylor, what's contained in that paragraph is something that you discussed? No. In any event, what's contained in that paragraph 
is consistent with what you believe was the church's expectation of you? Yes. Um, now, you see that that letter is dated September 1999. Yes. Um, do you have any particular recollection of that date or do you just remember that date because it's on this letter? Mainly due to the date on the letter. Um, the, the time that you had a meeting with uh, Pastor Taylor and Pastor Mudford, can I ask you about that? Do you remember if that occurred in 1998 or 1999 or you just remember it occurring? It was early before that. It was 1998 in November. It was just before the 99 changeover, yes. Um, and you recall that this letter that we're looking at on the screen in front of you... Yes. ...doesn't relate in time to that meeting. Is that right? No. Did you receive anything from Pastor Taylor after that meeting? No. That is the 1998 meeting. Sorry? The 1998 meeting with Pastor Mudford and Pastor Taylor. No. Um, is it possible that the meeting you recall having happened with Pastor Mudford and Taylor, that those were meetings that occurred on two separate days? That is, a meeting with Pastor Mudford and then you met with Pastor Taylor on another date? No, Pastor Mudford came to my house, then Pastor pa uh, pa Barbara Taylor came to my house. On the same day? On the same day. Now, I appreciate that for some time you may not have known the full extent of what Pastor Taylor did to pursue the abuse that you reported to her. Is that fair to say? That's a fair statement, sir, yes. And is it right that now, today, you have more of a knowledge of that than you once did? Yes. And you're aware that Pastor Taylor uh, went to considerable lengths to seek the intervention of the church hierarchy in the case? I wasn't aware until I saw statements. And included in that, are you aware of uh, her understanding from you that you were very sensitive about this matter being discussed in a public or open way? Yes. You understand that that was a thing that concerned her? Yes. And is it fair to say that that was a concern yourself had uh, during the period of 1998 and 1999? Yes. Um, originally, when you spoke to Pastor Taylor, it's not the case that there was any discussion about the details of the abuse, was there? Not that I can recollect, no. And that the process basically commenced because your mother came forward and told Pastor Taylor and, and others. Yes. Uh, that process caused you some distress. Yes. And is it correct to say that part of the reason for that distress, apart from embarrassment and those feelings, was that you felt you had a loss of control in the situation? I was more embarrassed and ashamed and being exposed. I, it, to me personally... It was a heinous act, and I, I don't know why it turned on myself that I didn't want to be exposed. I just wanted to forget about it. All right. Um, throughout 1999, do you recall if um, Pastor Taylor rang you uh, to organise for you to speak with Frank? I can't recall, sorry. Do you remember if... Uh, for a period of time after you told or you had a meeting with Pastor Taylor about what had happened to you, that she left the country for a period of time? No. Do you remember um, anything between the meeting that you describe happening there in paragraph... Uh, sorry, uh, in paragraph 15 of your statement, which is the... Do you have that in front of you? Yes. Do you, do you recall between that meeting... This is the meeting between Taylor, Mudford and yourself... Yes. If between that time and the time that you uh, had a visit from both of them in the following September, there was any efforts on the part of Pastor Taylor to speak with you about this? No. Do you accept that 
in fact, throughout 1999, there was further contact between you and Pastor Taylor? It possibly could be, but I cannot recall. All right. Uh, in 1998, uh, you were aged about 36, is that right? Yes. Did Pastor Taylor have a conversation with you in which she said to you something along the lines of, she will be guided by what you want to do? I didn't hear that, sorry. Did, do you remember <coughs> if Pastor Taylor ever had a conversation with you in which she said, in relation to dealing with the matter, she would be guided by what you wanted to do? No. Did she ever communicate to you any of the difficulties that she was having dealing with the hierarchy of the church? No. Do you recall during 1999 that Pastor Taylor eventually stopped seeing you? Do you have any memory of that? No. And in fact, to be fair to you, you don't really recall her seeing you or having contact with you regularly throughout that year? Not a lot, no. You asked a question by council assisting about a conversation that may or may not have happened, and I just want to clarify something about that. You were asked about whether or not you'd ever mentioned a chamber magistrate in your discussions with Pastor Taylor. You have no memory of, of that reference? No, only just that I'd, I'd spoken to a solicitor and I'd made about two or three uh, sentences and emotionally I just couldn't cope. I collapsed and I left. And what led you to speaking to the solicitor? I felt I was being overwhelmed, the exposure, and I thought I need to do something about this, but it didn't work out. And did, did that approach to a solicitor occur sometime before November of 1999? It possibly could have, could have done. Is it fair to say then, given your answer just a moment ago, that throughout that period of time, throughout that year of 1999, you were having enough interaction with the church or Pastor Taylor that you were feeling exposed by what was happening? Objection. I think needs people one or the other. Yeah, right. I'll, rather I'll rephrase both. that. I think it was a self-correction. Yeah. <laughs> there was. Uh, is it fair to say that by the time you went and spoke to the solicitor at the end of 1999, uh, you'd had such contact with Pastor Taylor that you felt exposed? Well, anything that I had to do that exposed this, it did expose me, yes. And, and speaking to Pastor Taylor did expose me, yes. So you remember during 1990... You're sorry, I'll withdraw that. You don't remember the extent of your contact with Pastor Taylor throughout most of 1999, but you recall feeling that the result of that was feelings of exposure and vulnerability. Is that yes. fair to say? Um, do you remember having a telephone conversation late in 1999 with Pastor Taylor? So this is after the letter that we were just looking at, in which you told her, sorry, in which she told you that um, Frank had made some confession? Yes. Do you remember her telling you that he had been stood down? <coughs> no. Um, do you remember if you had indicated to her at about that time, or in that phone conversation, that you were seeking advice in relation to your legal options? No. Of that conversation, what do you recall? Not a lot. Did Pastor Taylor try to give you some pastoral advice or support during that conversation? Not that I can recall. Do you recall Pastor Taylor trying to provide you with that sort of advice? No. At any time? At any time. I, I, maybe she did. I can't recall that. We did have talks now and again, but no. 
Just by final way of clarification, if you could just have a look at your statement, and I draw your attention to paragraph 15 on page 4 of that document. You'll see there that there's a reference to um, both pastors, Taylor and Mudford, saying things to the effect that Frank Houston couldn't have done that, he's a good man. Yes. Do you recall, and I see that you've said to the following effect, you don't recall those exact words being used. Is that right? I wouldn't say that that could be the exact words. It was a heated conversation. Kevin Mudford was extremely explosive and there was a lot of yelling. And they were just parts and pieces that I can recall. Is it your recollection that he was angry about the allegation or about Pastor Frank? Both. In relation to Pastor Taylor, do you have a specific memory of what she said? No, sir. Um, that's just your best account of your understanding or your perception of that meeting? Yes, sir. Do you recall if Pastor Taylor said anything to the effect of... They wanted to be sure because if they came forward, they might lose their jobs. Sorry? That they wanted to be sure about what you were saying because if they came forward, they could lose their jobs. I don't understand uh, the question, sorry. Do you remember if anything like that was said by Pastor Taylor? No. But to be Mr. fair, Koenigan, yes. do you mean they, meaning Pastor Mudford and Pastor Both. Taylor, yes. were communicating that to Mr. AHA? I'm you, a, I, yeah, that's what I'm asking. Do you understand that's what... If you could clarify that yeah, again. Perhaps, sure. If you just ask that again. During the conversation that you've recorded at paragraph 15 of your statement, yes. do you recall if Pastor Taylor said anything to you about the need to be clear on what you were alleging? Because if they, that is, Pastors Taylor and Mudford came forward, they could lose their jobs. No, I don't recall that. You do recall that Pastor Taylor said that she would go forward and speak to the hierarchy of the church? Yes. And that she would do that <coughs> on your behalf? Yes. And that she would get back to you about the outcome of that? Yes. But it's the case that you don't recall the full extent of what she got back to you about or when she got back to you? I don't... No, that's exactly right. Thank you. Nothing further, Your Honour. Mr Koenigan. Mr Higgins. Thank you, Your Honour. Uh, Mr AHA, my name's Higgins and I appear for the Hillsong Church and Brian Houston. So you understand the perspective from which I'm approaching? Yes. Um, what I propose to do is I'll ask, ask you questions about different topics and if it assists you I'll announce what that topic is and before I move to the next topic I'll announce the fact that I've finished and then moving on to a new one. Would it be suitable to you if I did it that way? Yes. Okay, I want to first ask you some questions about what I characterise as the um, unwillingness or a reluctance on your part to open, to have your um, allegations openly disclosed in the period 98 through to 2000. Do you understand the issue I'm going to be asking about? Yes. Um, is it fair to say that leading up to October 98, you did not give your mother, AHI, permission to disclose to Pastor Taylor what you had disclosed to your mother in 1978? Yes. Um, and that you were not aware, uh, as at October 98, that your mother intended to disclose to Pastor Taylor um, what you had disclosed to your mother in 1978? That's correct. So that... The, is, it, is it the case that the first you knew about it, uh, that your mother had disclosed to Pastor Taylor what you told your mother in 1978 was the meeting with Mr Mudford and Pastor Taylor? Yes. I understand you say 
that Mr Mudford first attended and then Pastor Taylor attended thereafter, but on the same day? Yes. All right. Um, is it fair to say that when you became aware that your mother had told uh, Pastor Taylor and she told Mr Mudford you were firstly shocked? Yes. Um, angered? Yes. Specifically angered with your mother? Yes. Um, and is it fair to say that you felt vulnerable? Yes. And did you feel vulnerable because you were concerned that this would, be, this would come out into the open? Yes. You, you were concerned that you would be judged for it? Yes. And as you tell us in paragraph 28 of your statement, Exhibit 18.001, that for many years you felt shame? Yes. Fear? Yes. And embarrassment? Yes. And were they the, the, the motivations for you to feel uh, anger with your mother for her unsolicited disclosure to Pastor Taylor? Yes. And as raised with you by counsel for Pastor Taylor, did you feel that by reason of the disclosure, it meant that you were not in control of what would happen with the disclosure? Yes. Um, I just want to ask some questions still on this issue about this characterisation of reluctance to disclose, but specifically about the meeting with Mr Mudford. Um, and if it assists you, can we brought up on screen tab one, and it's uh, AHA statement, paragraph 15, please. Would you agree that what you have for you is paragraph 15 on the screen from your statement? Yes. And that this deals with uh, that part of the meeting you say was between yourself and uh, Pastor Mudford? Yes. Right. Um, <coughs> would you agree with this that the way in which you describe that meeting occurring is that Pastor Mudford's anger was with you for the allegation. Oh, well, that, that would be a fair deduction, yes. All right. So the way you interpret um, Mr. Pastor Mudford's approach to you was that he was bullying you or browbeating you for having the audacity to make such an allegation. Yes. Um, I wonder if it can be brought up on the screen tab two. It's the statement of Pastor Taylor. And could it be paragraph 12, please? Would you read paragraph 12 quietly to yourself? And when you've done that, please tell me. That would be correct, yes. I just want to find out what it is you say is correct. Um, firstly, would you agree that Pastor Taylor and Mr Mudford attended your home together? From memory, I think it was uh, Kevin arrived first uh, and then Pastor Taylor followed. All right. You understand that Pastor Taylor suggests, at least in that part of her statement, that, uh, it, that they went together? As far as I know, they might have come together, but I'm pretty sure that it was um, Mudford first and then Pastor Taylor arrived later. It wasn't long. It was only, I think, a matter of moments, minutes. Um, and can I suggest this to you, that by, by reading paragraph 12, um, was it the case that Pastor Mudford's anger was a consequence not of your audacity to make the allegation? but of his anger of what had been perpetrated against you? 
I think it was a, a spectrum of both. All right. So that would this be fair that having read that part of Pastor Taylor's statement, you would say, look, initially I was of the view that Pastor Mudford was angry at me for having the audacity to make such an allegation, but I would accept that it's equally possible that Pastor Mudford's anger was a consequence of what I was reporting of having been done to me. Yes. Um, so that at least on that second interpretation, would you accept that it may not have been the case that Pastor Mudford was seeking to browbeat you, um, but rather to express his anger over what you were reporting? Again, I'll repeat, it was a spectrum of both. Okay. That was how I felt. Um, it might be, but I can just ask you to attend yourself to the second of those. Yep. Would you agree that it could equally be the situation that Pastor Mudford wasn't there to browbeat you, but rather was there to express his anger firstly at what had been done to you? That wouldn't be the way I took it. That wouldn't? That wasn't the way I took it. All right. But you accept now, having read that part of Pastor Taylor's statement, that that is an equally available conclusion? Yes. Um, and is it also true where it also reports at paragraph 12 of tab 2 that um, you were distraught uh, about the, the fact that anyone knew about the allegation? Yes. And were you distraught that anyone would thereafter find out about the allegation? Yes. So it's fair to say that as at 4th of November 98, um, you didn't want the allegation to go any further than what it had? Yes. Um, is it fair to, fair to say that the next day, on the 5th of November 98, Pastor Taylor visited you? I cannot recall. Um, could be brought up on the screen, please. Tab to Annexure A. <coughs> could it scroll down to the 5th of November, please? Uh, Mr AHA, could you read the entry for 5th of November quietly to yourself? When you've done that, please tell me. Yep. Does that refresh your memory as to whether Pastor Taylor attended and spoke to you? That's her statement. Yep. But I can't recall that. Um, even though you can't recall it, would it be inconsistent or would it be consistent with your memory of that time that you would have been really shocked or I think it describes as reeling with shock uh, the fact that um, you knew that your mother had disclosed or betrayed your confidence? Yes. And accepting that you don't actually remember Pastor Taylor visiting on the 5th of November, but accepting that it's not inconsistent what she reports about your state of mind at that time. Yes. Um, it, there's a con would you agree that there's a continuation, at least up until that date, that you didn't want this allegation to go any further than what it had? Yes. Um, moving forward, if I may... <coughs> To, could you bring up on the screen, please, uh, tab to annexure J, please. Thank you. Um, would you accept from me, this is a file note of uh, meeting between yourself or a, or a conversation between yourself and Pastor Taylor on the 25th of November 99. Would 
you accept that from me? Yes. I'm not offended if you don't. I'm a lawyer after all, but it's, it's part of the tender of the brief. Right. Um, accepting that it's the 25th of November 99, um, do you agree that it fairly records what is your state of mind, at least insofar as the first line with the pencilled asterisk next to it? Yes. Um, and that was it your state of mind, as at the 25th of November 99, was that whilst you were prepared to admit the allegations occurred against you, um, you didn't want them to be a matter of public knowledge? Yes. So that, is it fair to say then that between the 5th of November 98 that I previously took you to, where Pastor Taylor attended your home, and the 25th of November 99, that whilst you were angered that you had been outed, if I could suggest that, about the allegation, um, your attitude was that you were prepared to ad admit that these things had occurred against you, but you didn't want them in the public domain? I was prepared to ad admit to them, but the whole thing I just didn't want to get involved with, to me, was a hideous secret, and I just didn't want to have it exposed. It was my personal feeling. Indeed. I think, in answer to questions from counsel for Pastor Taylor a moment ago, you said that you you realised after reading the statement of Pastor Taylor that she'd gone to uh, great efforts to ensure you, sensitivity towards you and the public disclosure of the allegations throughout the period 98, 99? Yes. And that that was consistent with how you felt at that time, 98, 99? Yes. That you did not wish them to be disclosed? Yes. So that come 25th of November 99, is it fair to say that your state of mind was, well, I'm not going to lie and say it didn't occur, but equally, if I can avoid this going into the public domain, that is my preference? That would be correct. <clears throat> um, and as it's... Can I suggest to you that it's accurate in that document at tab J, 2J, where it indicates in the fourth line down that you were bitter about the exposure through your mother? Yes. And would that be an accurate recount of what your state of mind was as at the 25th of November 99? As far as I can recollect, that would be an account of it. Accurate, I couldn't say. Well, you don't, you don't say that you, as at the 25th of November, were not angry with your mother for the outing? No, I was. Um, <clears throat> and is part of that bitterness or anger towards your mother at that time because you felt that it was taken from your control? Yes. Um, I finished with that document. I wonder if we could bring up, please, uh, tab two, an extra L for Lima. Mr AHA, can I just uh, confirm this, uh, still about this issue of the reluctance for the disclosure of the allegations. Um, confirm that as at late November 99, that 
you were aware that a meeting was to be convened between Pastor Taylor and um, Brian Houston uh, to discuss the allegations that were made. I don't recollect that meeting. Right. When you say I don't recollect that meeting, do you mean by that, look, I'm not, I'm not saying I once didn't know about it, I just don't remember it now, or do you mean by that I never knew that that meeting was... I never knew that meeting existed, yes. Mm -hmm. um, can I invite you just to look at the document which is on the screen before you, tab 2, L for Lima... Firstly, would you, would you accept that it's a letter from Pastor Taylor to Brian Houston? Yes, it's got Dear Brian at the top, yes. And that it refers to a meeting on a, on a Saturday. Yes. And then moving down to the fourth paragraph, do you see it refers to telephone call between Pastor Taylor and yourself? So what was the question? Would you agree that that paragraph deals with a telephone call between yourself and Pastor Taylor? Yes. Right. Do you remember the telephone call? No, I don't. Right. Um, you don't deny the telephone call occurred? If I, I can't remember it, so I can't say yes or no. It, it could have happened, but maybe it didn't, but I don't remember it. Right. Um, would it be fair to say that as at late November 99, your state of mind about the disclosure of the allegations remained the same? Yes. That you did not want it to be a matter of public disclosure? Yes. You did not wish there to be any investigation involving at least the secular authorities? Yes. You did not wish there to be an investigation involving the non-secular or the church authorities? Yes. Um, yes, I agree with you, or yes, I did wish there to be? Repeat the question, please. Certainly. Um, you did not wish there to be any investigation by the church authorities as at late November 99? I couldn't tell you what I was thinking at that stage. Um, can I then invite you to have a read of, uh, well, by reference to the document in front of you on the screen, and would it be fair to say that it's reported there that you were told in that telephone call that Frank Houston had admitted uh, the incident? As I'm reading, yes. And that when you were told that, it shocked you? Yes. Or it surprised you? Would, I would say that would have happened, yes. And it surprised you because your thinking as at that time was you weren't expecting him to admit this at all? I didn't think that he would, no. Um, and that do you have a memory that as at late 99 you were informed that he had made admissions? I'd heard it through different voices that the, he was admitting to it, yes. And do you remember feeling surprised about that at the time? Yes. And do you remember feeling uh, that there was a, a change in your attitude about how you were going to be dealt with by at least the church? I don't think there was any difference in my feelings, no. You'd agree that the document in front of you report, records that that part of it that, quote, there was a complete change in attitude, uh, full stop, end quote. Yes, I can see that. Do you disagree with that as an accurate record of your state of mind? Well, can I just 
object to that. Perhaps um, Mr Higgins could say what he's suggesting that the complete change in attitude was about, because it may have been complete change in attitude to whether Frank Houston would agree with the allegation, not necessarily about the church investigation of it. I'm happy to do that. Can the document be brought back on the screen, please? Um, by reference to that paragraph and indeed the preceding sentence, can I suggest that the complete change in attitude attributed to you... I object to that. It's not... <clears throat> there's a complete change in attitude. It equally might be read that yes. the attitude was that of Frank Houston. Yes. Well, that, yeah. I think that was Miss McGlinchey's point. All right. I accept that. And, Mr Higgins, you, I mean, I, you're not able to go beyond that, really in terms of what's in the document, unless you've got some separate instructions. Um, Your Honour, the only question was to indicate whether or not this witness had a complete change in attitude. That would be the fair certainly way. certainly can it? ask that question. All right. Um, Mr HA, is it the case that you had a complete change in attitude when you heard in late 99 that uh, Frank Houston had made admissions? No, I didn't have a change in attitude. I was relieved that he'd spoken up, but that was as far as that went. And so is it fair then to say that if you didn't have a complete change in attitude, you remained with the same resolve that you did not want this to become a matter of... Uh, to be investigated? Yes. Um, as a result of... I'll draw that. Did Pastor Taylor suggest to you that in view of Frank Houston's admissions, you might seek ministry from Brian Houston? I can't recall that conversation. Um, in late 99... Even though you don't remember a conversation with Pastor Taylor, did you form the view that you would seek ministry from Pastor Houston, from Brian Houston? No, not at all. Um, you agree that the document in front of you suggests that Pastor Taylor gave you advice to seek ministry from Brian Houston? third last line of that paragraph I've taken you to. It's just what it says there. I advise him to see you for, uh, yeah, for ministry. Now, I appreciate you say, look, I don't remember this conversation, but can I suggest to you that uh, it's inconsistent with your assertion a moment ago that you were not of the view that you were going to seek ministry from Mr Houston? Mr. Houston. Brian Houston. Commissioner, can I just take objection to this whole line of questioning in that these are... Um, is someone else's letter, right? It's not um, Mr Higgins' client's uh, letter, and there's no way, really, that he can challenge my client's assertion that he doesn't recall the conversation and he doesn't... that that, that was not something that he considered doing. Section 44 of the Evidence Act doesn't apply in these proceedings, the old rule in Queen's case. I would submit that it's not impermissible by reason of Section 44 not applying. Secondly is um, the witness has some memory problems, which are not a criticism of him, it's just a reality of the, the fluxion of time, and that these documents that I am taking him to are, albeit hearsay representations about conversations had with this witness by other persons to give evidence. In my submission, it's not impermissible what I'm doing. I think Ms McGlinchey's point is that... Um, I think the larger point is of what particular value um, ultimately the Commission can make of it. And Mr AHA is indicating he, he doesn't recall. 
um, the conversation. So taking him through it piece by piece uh, doesn't particularly assist us. Um, as that last point, I, my submission is he goes further than to say I don't particularly recall whether or not I was going to seek. I was advised to seek ministry. His evidence is. I was of the view I was not going to seek ministry from Pastor Houston, so I seek to take him to a recount of a representation uh, by another to him um, and ask him whether that's correct. Is that somewhere outside this letter? Uh, no, it's as a consequence of this letter. So this letter says, as Your Honour can read, yes. uh, what it does... Yes. Uh, it's inconsistent with what this witness has said about that particular fact. And I seek to take this witness to another witness's fact in a contemporaneous document. An account of what was said. Go on. Thank you. Uh, Mr AHA, do you see that that letter asserts that you were advised to seek ministry from Brian Houston? Yes. You agree that you told us a moment ago that you did not intend to seek ministry from Brian Houston? No. Were you advised by Barbara Taylor to seek ministry from Brian Houston? No, only in that letter that she gave me that I seek ministry for or counselling. That's as far as I can recollect. Well... When you say that's as far as I can recollect, do you mean by that, look, she may have said it, but I don't remember now? I can't answer to something that I really can't recall. I'm just going to move on to something else, if I may. So I'm leaving the issue of what I characterise as the reluctance to disclose. And if I could just move to the conversation that you say occurred between yourself and Brian Houston um, in paragraph 21 of your statement. Do you understand the point at time I'm going to be asking you about? Paragraph 21 of your statement, you have the call that you say occurred between you and Brian Houston about two months after your meeting with Pastor, well, Frank Houston at McDonald's. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll deal with the issue of date in a moment. I just want to deal with the, the genesis of of the call or how the call came about, if I may. Um, you say at paragraph 21 of tab one that you telephoned Brian Houston and, as I understand it, it was for the purpose of chasing up the money that you understood was to be paid to you but had not been paid to you. Yes. Um, could it have been the situation that in fact, it was Brian Houston who rang you. No. Uh, you're absolutely definite about that? Yes. And was this the only telephone call between you and Brian Houston? As far as I can see, yes, that was. Um, can I ask that uh, tab two and extra J be brought up on the screen, please? document I showed you a moment ago from the 25th of November, would you agree that at this point in time, one of the matters you told uh, Pastor Taylor about in the second line was that you're weighing up whether to go to the secular courts for compensation? It's possible I would have said that. All right. Well, there's no reason for you to doubt the accuracy of that part of that file note, is there? No. And if um, tab two 
and lecture K for Kilo. Could be brought up on the screen, please. I appreciate you were not present for this, but you agree that we now know from Ms Taylor that there was a meeting three days after she speaks to you with um, Mrs Houston and McMartin about your allegation. Yes. And there was a... Do you agree that paragraph four suggests there was an expectation or a request by Pastor Taylor that you receive counselling organised and paid for by the Assembly of God? That's what it says there. And that it was flagged by Pastor Taylor to uh, at least Mr Houston that um, there was a possibility you'd go to the secular courts. That's possible. Um, un understood to be for compensation. That would be possible, yes. All right. Um, all right. Can we... Can it now be brought up on the screen? Tab 2, an, an extra L for Lima. And you'll see this is that same letter I showed you a moment ago from Pastor Taylor to... Uh, Brian Houston. And would you agree that as at late November 99, um, you now know that Pastor Taylor was trying to organise counselling for you uh, paid for and uh, by Assembly of God. I wasn't aware of that. No, I understand that. My question to you was, you now know that Pastor Taylor was trying to organise counselling for you uh, paid for by the Assembly of God. Right, yes. And you now know, as a consequence of her notes from the 28th of November 99, that she'd met with Brian Houston... Uh, and made that request? Yes, from the notes that I've read, yes. Yeah. And, and informed Brian Houston that you were contemplating going to the secular courts to seek compensation? Yes. And you know from the file note of the 25th of November 99, two documents earlier, that you, had, that you don't disagree that it's possible you told Pastor Taylor that you were contemplating going to the secular courts for compensation? It's possible. Possible. Yep. Um, so that... Can I suggest this to you, that the, the situation as at late 99 was that you were telling Pastor Taylor, look, uh, I'm not going to deny the allegation if I'm asked... Yes. I'm contemplating going to the secular courts to seek compensation. Yes. Um, you now know that she was negotiating on your behalf for counselling. Yes. And you now know that one of the persons she was negotiating that with was Brian Houston. Yes. Can document uh, tab three K A one be brought up on the screen, please? And can we go to paragraph numbered eight, uh, nine? I beg your pardon, eight. Um, it probably scrolled up before you could read it, but would you accept from me that what this is is it's um, minutes of a meeting said to have occurred on the 22nd of December 99 for the uh, special executive meeting of the Assemblies of God? Mm. Yes. You were not here 
for this meeting. No. You'd agree that one of the resolutions of that meeting, paragraph eight, was that Brian Houston would meet with you and explain the process of discipline and restoration that's been followed. Would you agree that that's one of the resolutions? Just repeat that question again. Would you agree that one of the resolutions of this special meeting was that Brian Houston would meet with you and explain the process of discipline and restoration that's been followed? That's what it says there, yes. And that it was agreed at that meeting that you would be assured as to your identity not being disclosed? That's what it says. And that your desire for anonymity would be honoured? Yes. Um, and that you'd be offered counselling if you desired it? Yes. I appreciate you were not there at this meeting. Um, would it be consistent with your memory as at late 99 that you wished your anonymity to be honoured? That would be, yes. And would it be consistent with your memory as at late 99 that your identity... Uh, I'll withdraw that. That... I'll withdraw that part of the question. Um, is... In view of these documents that you now know about, can I suggest to you that in late 99, it was Brian Houston who rang you? No. Just bear with me. I ask that uh, document tab two and extra K be brought up on the screen, please. K for kilo. Let's see if I've got the right one. No, I've got the incorrect one. I do beg your pardon. It's the following document, which is L. And if you could scroll down to the handwritten entries at the bottom. Uh, Mr AHA, do you see a handwritten entry there under Pastor Taylor's signature? Yes. Indicating that before this letter of the 29th of November 99 was sent to Brian Houston, um, Pastor Taylor was a, aware from your mother that you were trying to contact Brian Houston. That's what it says there, but I cannot recall. Do you remember whether after your... Sorry. Do you remember whether in late November of 99, as a result of a conversation with Pastor Taylor, you felt the need to telephone Brian Houston? I can't answer that because I just cannot recall that. And do you see the next handwritten entry on the 1st of December? Yes. Suggesting that Pastor Taylor, as a result of what she'd learnt the day before, rang Mr McMartin to tell him about your desire to speak to Brian. Yes, I can, I can see that, but again, I, I don't have knowledge of that because I cannot remember that. Indeed. But now that you're aware of it, could it be the case that you're attempting to ring Brian Houston, you're unsuccessful and your aunt contacted... Mr McMartin to get Brian to ring you? 
Well, that's so simple. Yeah, I, I Bear with me. Can I ask that uh, document tab? An extra M for Mike. Brought up on the screen, please. Still dealing with this issue of who made the telephone call. I invite you to go to paragraph number two. Now, this is Pastor Taylor's notes of what she intended to raise with Mr McMartin at a meeting on the 21st of December 99. Yep. Accept that from me? Yes. And you see from paragraph number two that Pastor Taylor intended asking Mr Martin whether or not he knew that Brian had made phone contact with you and that you had a perception of how that telephone call went. That's what I'm reading, yes. All right. um, is this the same telephone call that you refer to at paragraph 21 of your statement? I couldn't honestly say. But it's, you only remember having one telephone conversation with Mr Martin, uh, sorry, with Mr Houston, Brian. I remember that phone call, yes. You still say that it was you who made that telephone call? Yes. Um, can I... I note... Can, can I ask that uh, tab one be brought up on the screen, please? And paragraph 21. Thank you. But I just want to ask you some questions about the timing of this telephone conversation, if I may. Paragraph 21, you refer to this conversation as having occurred about two months after your meeting with Frank McDonald, Frank Houston at the McDonald's? Thereabouts, yes. Um, and can I ask that the screen scroll back to <coughs> paragraph 20? Commencement of 20, please. And by reference to the screen, Mr AHA, would you agree that paragraph 20 deals with your meeting at the McDonald's uh, at Thornley? Yep. Yes. And you refer to it as being on or about late 2000? Yes. Um, if I was to suggest to you that it was late 99, uh, what would you say about that? It was further along. I think it was in the late 2000. OK. Um, earlier in your evidence, you amended the date at paragraph 12 from 
September on or about September ninety nine to the third of November ninety eight. Yes. What source did you use to refresh your memory that that was the accurate date? Uh, an entry in my mother's diary. And uh, when did you have regard to that? Uh, just recently. Um, working then from that <clears throat> reference point in paragraph 12 as being the 3rd of November 98, does it follow that the meeting with Pastor Mudford was, as suggested by Pastor Taylor, on the 4th of November 98? I couldn't say. So, by reference to tab one, paragraph 14 of your statement, when you say shortly thereafter, referring to the events set out in paragraphs 12 and 13, that there was the meeting with Pastor Mudford, is it fair to say that shortly thereafter means within a day or two of the 3rd of November 98? Yes. And over the page, paragraph 16, you use two reference points for uh, the events there. One of them, you say, is the date of the letter itself. And the other one, you say, it's about a week after Pastors Taylor and Mudford came to my house. Sorry, what was the question? You used two reference points in paragraph 16 of your statement. One is the, the date of the letter itself. Yes. And the other is that it was about a week after pastors Taylor and Mudford came to your house. Do you see that? Yes. Um, is it the case that... Um, it was the 16th of September, 99, and not about a week after Pastors Taylor and Mudford came to your house that the events in paragraph 16 occurred. Between them coming and then the letter re uh, re I received or was told about, it was a, a period of months. Yep. About 10, 11 months? 8, 9, 10 months, yeah. Okay. And... Um, in, so it's still with your, your points of reference. If you go to paragraph 17, and you speak of, at least in that statement, you say, the only contact I had was from Pastor Frank himself, um, who started calling me and my mother on a regular basis. The phone calls started coming about a week or two after I received the letter on the 16th of September. 99 from Pastor Taylor. Yeah, that, w that was incorrect. It was earlier than that, before that date, a letter had arrived. So is it correct that you were in contact with Frank Houston um, in the months before receiving the letter of the 16th of September 99? Yes. And... Was it during that time that you're in contact with him in the months before the 16th of September 99 that you had firstly this meeting at Redfern Railway Station? Yes. And the meeting at McDonald's at Thornley? No, that came later. Right. Um, if I could just interrupt, um, just so we can be clear, there was not actually a meeting at Redfern, yes. just so that the uh, record is clear. There was an arrangement. For a, for a meeting okay. that ultimately didn't take place. I meant no advantage by it. Um, the meeting at Redfern was an arrangement, but it didn't actually take place. Yes. OK. But you agree that whatever it was that did occur, that was arranged to have occurred in the months leading up to the 16th of September 99 when you received that letter? Yes.
bear with me. So that when you say at paragraph 18 of your statement that the arrangement to meet at Redfern Railway Station was on or about early 2000, that would not be correct, would it? It was probably prior to that. And, um, in fact, it was prior to the 16th of September 99, wasn't it? Yes. And equally, can I suggest to you that the event you refer to in <coughs> paragraph 20, McDonald's at Thornley, was also earlier than what you've disclosed there? I'm not exactly accurate with that either. I can't say if that was exactly the date. No, I don't know. Um, well, what I'm suggesting to you is that you're... Is it the case that you're not certain whether it occurred before the 16th of September letter or not? The meeting with Frank Houston. At, at uh, McDonald's Thornley. No, I think... I think the letter came first and then the meeting followed. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, I can't recall because I, I'm saying you this, but... I cannot be accurate because I can't recall exactly the dates. It's not a criticism of you, but I'm just trying to determine the extent to which you're willing to concede that it could have been before the, before the letter was received. Again, I can't say because I can't exactly remember the dates. OK. Commissioner, can I just um, say, we're spending a lot of time on trying to establish dates where the witness has conceded yes. that he is uncertain about dates. Um, mm. It's a long time ago and I'm not really certain where this is all going. If there's a positive to ca a case to put, perhaps it could be put. Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to put what the concern is, is that um, there, there is a difference of some 12 months between what this, this witness says was <coughs> the response by... Uh, Brian Houston and Hillsong to its being informed of the allegations based on the material supplied by Pastor Taylor and what Pastor Taylor says and what Mr Brian Houston says on behalf of himself and Hillsong uh, as being 12 months earlier. That's the forensic purpose that I'm engaged in, which I would submit would assist this inquiry in deciding the timeliness or otherwise, which is likely to be a criticism, if this evidence is accepted. Well, I think now is the time, Mr Higgins, to put that directly to this witness. Yes, Your Honour, please. Um, Mr AHA, can I suggest this to you, that... Um, Brian Houston spoke to you on the telephone, whoever rang one another, let's put aside for a minute, but Brian Houston spoke to you on the telephone in late 99 or the first month of 2000. I don't recall him calling me. Um, I'm not focusing on whether he contacted you at the moment. It's more about the timing of it. What I'm suggesting to you is that the telephone call between you and Brian Houston was late 99 or early 2000? I can't recall the exact time. I'm sorry. And that whenever it was, your state of mind at that time about the preparedness to have this allegation, the subject of an investigation was you did not want it. I wasn't happy about the exposure, no. That's not an answer to my question. My question to you is you did not want this allegation to be the subject of, and I'll be specific, an investigation by the church authorities? No. No, I don't agree with you, or no, I did no, not? No, that I did not want. You didn't? I'm sorry, had you finished? Yes. You did not want 
the allegation to be the subject of an investigation by secular authorities? By anyone. I'd had enough of it and I just wanted to put it to rest. And that in the course of the telephone call with Mr Houston, you expressed that view to him? I can't express a view to him when I can't recall the conversation. What I wrote in my statement is what I said. Um, well, what you wrote in your statement is what you recall saying. That's correct. All right. But you don't suggest, do you, that that's all that was said? It was a short conversation. It might have been. But what is in paragraph 21 is not all that was said, is it? What I wrote in my statement is what I wrote in my statement, and that's the truth as far as I can uh, Mr. produce. Mr H.A., I wonder if you might attend yourself to my question. What you record at paragraph 21 is not all that was said in that telephone conversation, is it? That's as far as I can recollect. And do you mean by that answer that other things could have been said but you don't have a memory of them? That's possible. All right. Um, was it your state of mind at the time of that telephone call that you wanted to be believed? I think it had gone past at that stage. Um, it, it might have, but is that what you believe... Is that what your state of mind was as at the time of that telephone call? I object. Uh, I'm not sure whether we're, that's going to assist the Royal Commission. That is to say, whether he wanted to be believed or not, it's reasonably vague. I'm happy to address the mischief. You knew that what you had alleged was the truth, didn't you? Repeat that question. You knew that what you had alleged was the truth, didn't you? Yes. Throughout 98, 99, what you did not want to occur was that you were made out to be a liar about it. No, that's not correct. What was correct is I didn't want to be exposed and go through the process of what I'm going through now. Your Honour, I don't think there is any document that refers at all to this witness being a liar. I should have objected earlier to it, but there's no document that I've seen about this man being conscious of being called a liar. There's an issue about him not denying it, and uh, Mr Higgins has been to that, but I think it's a step too far to say that there was some issue about him being called a liar. I'm sure that... Th I don't think that's what Mr Higgins no, was wasn't. suggesting. No, it wasn't, but I'm happy to rephrase it mm. in case there is a misunderstanding, at least on council systems part. Um, Mr HA, one of the matters that... Can, I'll withdraw that. One of the reasons why you felt fear about the disclosure by your mother is that you did not want to be challenged about the truth of what you knew was true. No. What was the truth was what happened to me and I did not want to be exposed and dragged through the muck and mire of what I'm going through now. Um, In the course of your telephone call with Mr um, Houston, did he offer you counselling? This is Brian Houston. Oh, yes, thank you. I'm sorry. In the course of your telephone call with Brian Houston, did he offer you counselling? No. Um, in the course of your telephone call with him, did you... Uh, Tell him that you did not want the matter to proceed to any formal investigation. What I wrote in my statement is what I said. Yeah, but you've also told us you don't know whether... So I'll draw that. What you've also told us is that other things may have been said but you don't remember. What I wrote in my statement is what I, I'm going to testify is the truth and anything else that's not written there I'm not going to agree to and not be led by. Or... What anything else that's not in there, which you don't remember, you're unreceptive to acknowledging it may have occurred. 
As again, I'll say to you, as I've said in the statement, that is what I believe to be the truth, and I will not be shaken on that. I'm going to move on to another matter, if I may. So I finish with the issue of the telephone call, whenever it was, between you and Brian Houston. you understand? Yes. I want to move on to uh, some issues about dates. Can I ask that tab 1, paragraph 10, be brought up on the screen, please? <coughs> I invite you to read paragraphs 9 and 10 quietly to yourself. When you've done that, please tell me. Yes, I've read it. Um, by reference to paragraph 9, you inform us that the point of time in your life when the sexual abuse of you ceased by Frank Houston was um, upon you reaching puberty. Yes. Um, can you assist us with the age range at which you reached puberty? I think it was around the 16 years of bracket uh, or a little bit older, I can't recall. Sorry, you reached puberty at 16? Or before. OK. Um, I was getting older. I understand that. Um, the, perhaps I could approach it from another perspective. What age, age period were you when the sexual abuse of you ceased? The abuse was between seven and eight, and as the years progressed, it probably would have been up to around about the 10-ish, 11, somewhere around that area, I think. All right, and accepting you were born in 62, that would place at about 73 or 74. You're telling me that. I'm not sure of that. I haven't looked, worked it out myself, sorry. Well, um, I wasn't there. Uh, we know you were born in 62. Um, you, you've suggested... You reached puberty at about 16. Um, it, it surprises me. Can I suggest that... No, he didn't. He said 16 or before. Um, can I suggest that you were probably about 11 or 12 when you reached puberty? Would that be sound about right? That could be about right, yes. All right. No, and... I really... Um... <laughs> I'm a little taken aback by this line of questioning. I think his evidence was quite clear that the abuse occurred up to the age of 10 and 11 years old. Whether there's some form of inconsistency between his use of the term puberty is really neither here nor there. Is that where you're going, Mr Higgins? No, I'm, it's really about what is asserted in paragraph 10. So is it about timing? It is. Yes. Oh, well, you can get there. Thank you. Um, did the abuse cease when you were 10 or 11? I couldn't actually say because when we used to go to church, she would still come up and hug me, um, but it was slowly filtering off around that time as I got a bit older, it, it peaked off. Um, you say at paragraph 10 that I continued to attend Sydney CLC regularly after the abuse after the abuse stopped, full stop, end quote. Yes. Do you agree I've accurately read from that part of the statement? Yes. Um, am I correct in understanding that when the abuse was occurring, you were attending Sydney CLC? Yes. And that the abuse... Uh, I appreciate you say, look, I was 10 or 11, but it tapered off. What period of time are we looking at tapering off? Is it a year? period of years, because we were still in contact with the Houstons. Yeah. Um, if I was to suggest to you that Sydney CLC did not exist until August of 77, what would you say about that? There's nothing much I can say about it, is that my memory is not 100% exactly going back that far. OK. Um, see, when Sydney CLC was uh, created... 
Uh, you would have been 14 or 15 years of age, wouldn't you? You were saying that. I'm not agreeing with that, but I'm listening to what you're saying. Well, I'm asking you, um, accepting you were born in 62 and uh, accepting that Sydney CLC was created in August of 77. That would make you 14 or 15, depending on the month of the year in which you yep. were born. They also had a church beside there called the Koala Inn, and they were, I was also attending there. Right. I'm not suggesting for a moment the abuse of you did not occur. I'm more concerned about the, the timing that you ascribe in different parts of your statement. Um, could it be the case that the abuse of you had ceased about four years or so before Sydney CLC actually existed? The exact times I can't recall. Yeah, I'm probably not asking you about the exact times. I guess I'm really asking you to consider whether the sexual abuse of you by Frank Houston had ceased years before Sydney CLC came into existence? Now, I remember going into his office at one stage, but uh, I can't recall exactly the exact dates. All right. Just bear with me. Your Honour and Commissioner, just excuse me a moment. Yes. I'm still dealing with the issue of uh, some points in points of reference in time. I'm going to move to another one, if I may. Um, well, Commissioner, can I, can I object to these just? dealing with the issue of dates, unless it has some specific reference to Mr Higgins' client and some real point of issue before the Commission. Uh, the witness has said time and time again he is uncertain as yeah. to, to dates. I don't think there's that much that can be made out of that unless Mr Higgins has some point, a, a real point of issue uh, from his client's instructions. Um, Your Honour, the, just to answer the, the complaint, uh, the final matter that I was going to take this... Sorry, the final two points in time I was going to take AHA 2 are paragraphs 24 and 25 of his statement, which deals with incidents subsequent to uh, the telephone conversations. One said to occur in... Well, both said to have occurred in 2000. And uh, they're the only two matters left for this witness. Uh, insofar as the paragraph 24, it's not on an issue of timing, it's on an issue of what was said. On the issue of paragraph 25, um, I propose to put an exact date to him when this occurred, um, which I think answers the complaint. All right. You should be able to deal with those fairly succinctly, I should Mr be. Higgins. I should be. Thank you, Honour. Um, Mr AHA, can I invite you to look at paragraph 24 of your statement where you refer to a television sermon you witnessed, Mr Houston, Brian Houston, um, uh, say, amongst other things, that his father had been involved in a minor indiscretion that happened 30 years ago in New Zealand. Yes. If I suggest to you the phrase minor indiscretion was never used, you would disagree with that? No. Uh, when you say no, what do you mean by that answer? This is, as I wrote it, that's what I heard and that's what I wrote. OK. And when you came to do this statement, did you have a source uh, of contemporaneous documents that you relied upon for this entry? 
when I was watching TV, I was watching a Hillsong sermon and then he broke into that. Um, he may have. It's not an answer to my question with respect. Your statement's dated the 30th of September 2014 and you're referring to a TV program that you saw 14 years earlier, accepting your date. What sources did you use to recount the direct speech that you've extracted at paragraph 24? I don't know. That was when I, I saw it. I saw what I saw. Um, you may have... So you're using your memory? Yes. Using your memory of it? Yes. Moving to paragraph 25, you refer to an Australian... Uh, an ABC Australian story said to have occurred on or around 2000. Yes, but I, I also know that the Australian story was actually, I think it was 2004. I'll suggest you it was the 1st of August 2005. Oh, okay then. I'm staying corrected. All right. And that... When... Did you watch that program? The Australian story, yes. It was in transcript. I read it. And... Um, have you read the transcript of it? Yes. I'll show you this document. to go to the last page and in the left hand margin there should be a yellow marker line yes and can I invite you to read it not not the whole transcript but only the part which is marked with the yellow line in the margin and when you've done that please tell me you want to read that out or read it to no, myself just read it quietly to yourself After the witnesses read uh, that document, I'll have it put up on uh, Elmo so everybody else can read the relevant passage. I'm grateful. Thank you. I've read it. Does that accord with the way... Just before just before the question is asked, perhaps um, if we could... Who's the court officer? Court officer, if you just uh, obtain that document, I'll have it put up, and then it'll be on the screen in a moment. Can you pass that yellow part on the, on the screen? Um, I don't have my copies currently on the screen, so you'd have to ask the monitor to scroll down. Yes, I understand it's the last page. And it's those three paragraphs that are on the page at the moment, is that correct?
Yes. Um, Mr AHA, what you've read there, does that accord with your memory of the program, whenever it was, that was said by... Uh, if that's what was in the Australian story, that actually, I can't recollect that, but if, if that's what it is, that's what it is. They're my questions, thank you. Your Honour, I'll tender that copy of uh, the transcript of Australian story. 18.003. Thank you. Mr Chowdhury. Thank you. Uh, so, my name is Craig Chowdhury. I act for the Australian Christian Churches, the national body. It used to be Assemblies of God. Could the witness be shown, please, its tab, uh, its document G attached to the statement of Barbara Taylor, which is tab 2. Sir, so you were taken to this document earlier uh, by both counsel assisting uh, and other counsel. I just want to draw your attention to the second paragraph there. Before I do so, you do recall receiving this letter? Yes. Now, I should ask Barbara Taylor, she was related to you, or is related to you, isn't she? Yes. And what's the relation? She's my auntie. All right. And you called her auntie Barbara? Now and again, I have, yes. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, do you recall, read the second part? Pastor Taylor came back with this letter yes. and now I read it as is and that's where it stopped. All right. Well, you didn't want the church to do any investigation whatsoever, did you? I was in bewilderment. I didn't expect to be molested by such a leading minister and I didn't expect this sort of uh, treatment after what had come out and then I have to start proving myself and then it says, it says here, written accusations with time and place. Well... Can I suggest that the letter's not suggesting that you have to prove yourself? All it was simply saying is that the church had a structure in place if there's a written accusation, some details that they can investigate yes. time and place. Do you accept that? Yes. Right. And as you've said before, you are absolutely devastated uh, when your mother, without your knowledge or permission, disclosed to uh, Pastor Mudford and your aunt about the abuse, correct? Yes. And as you said to your aunt, you felt a uh, complete loss of power, correct? Yes. You wanted to have control over your life, correct? Like anyone else would. Indeed. And certainly, at this stage, in 99-2000, if anyone was going to go to the police to make a complaint, that was going to be you, correct? Yes. You would have been absolutely furious and shattered if someone else had notified the police without your knowledge? Yes. Thank you. Did you uh, want to get uh, funding from the Assemblies of God for counselling at this time?
it's fair to say that as a result of all this happening beyond your control, you wanted to be left alone? That would be correct. Okay. Just pardon for a moment. Yes, I've done further. Thank you. Ms McGlinchey. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Karen McGlinchey and I appear for AHA. Um, AHA, you've been asked uh, several questions about your reluctance to disclose and you have readily admitted you were very reluctant to disclose the, uh, uh, the abuse against you. Can you explain the cause of that reluctance? The cause of that reluctance is was I, was, I felt that what had happened to me was bad and wrong. It was also an infringement on my masculinity. I didn't... I'm a very male-orientated person. I'm not uh, homosexually orientated at all, and I was ashamed of that and embarrassed, and I just didn't want to uh, have that being broadcast right around through the church community. What would your been your expectation, if you had thought about it, mm. uh, about how the church would have handled the disclosure? I really don't I know. I that question. That's inviting uh, a speculative answer with respect. Well, I press the question. It's consistent with my instructions. Uh, I'm satisfied it's an appropriate uh, question to be put, and I'm... Um, think the Commission may be assisted by hearing the answer. Could you please repeat it again? Yeah. What was your expectation at the time on how the church may have handled uh, such a disclosure? I really don't know. Um, after what had taken place, I was pretty dismayed with the whole situation and I just felt I, I didn't want to go ahead. I felt terrible inside and I just didn't want to be dragged through the gutter because I just... I'm. I've seen things on the news and things when people expose themselves. They say that they've been raped or molested, and it's nothing good. Right. When you say dragged through the gutter, what do you mean by that? Through the church, um, the gossip, the innuendo. Um, Brian's remark that basically was my fault that I tempted his father, and it just everyone I seemed to turn to or speak to about was basically just cop it on the chin, man up, be quiet about it. And that was what I was concerned about. I had no one to turn to. Thank you. Despite the fact that Pastor Taylor, oh, Pastor Taylor had suggested that you received counselling, was it ever offered to you? No. Was it... Were you aware that there are options for counselling and that it may not have necessarily had to come through the church? I was told nothing. It was just dead space. There was nothing happening. I take it that you would have been reluctant to accept counselling associated with the church? If it yes. Had been to that. That, his previous answer is not responsive to the question. The question was about his awareness, not what he was told. I thought he was answering a question about his attitude, Mr. Mr. Higgins. Um, the, I, uh, perhaps I put the question badly. Yes, I could just, all right. I'll, I'll rephrase it. Um, I think you have given evidence that you would have been reluctant to accept counselling from the church. Yes. All right. Does that mean that you assumed that counselling would be provided via a church agency? No, I didn't. Again, I'll say that I just had no idea what was going on and I had no no uh, information coming back from the church what they were going to do. I was just in oblivion. Right, OK. All right. Did um, Brian Houston or any other person as a representative of the church ever meet with you to explain to you the process of discipline and restoration? No. Was ever was did anybody approach you about the possibility of such a meeting? No. Was anything like that ever offered to you? No. Okay. 
did any person from the church ever approach you either directly or through somebody else, such as Pastor Taylor, about whether you would be willing to assist the church in an investigation? No, only Pastor Taylor and Mudford on that meeting on that day, but outside of that, nothing. All right. So does that follow that nobody asked you your version of what happened with the abuse? No. Right, and nobody gave you the opportunity to recount the abuse? No. You've been asked a lot of questions about uh, the times that appear in your statement. Uh, how did you come to make this statement to the Royal Commission? I based it around the letter because it was only the only physical proof that I had, and so I worked with that date forwards and backwards. Right. It was the best that I had, and understanding the state of mind, I, it's not something I'm taking lightly, and what occurred to me was heinous, and it's had a long-term effect on me, and... Mentally, I, I find that it's not easy to recall a lot of the things. All right. Okay, I understand. Um, my question is, how did the statement come about? Was it? Did you do a telephone interview with an investigator or sit down with an, an investigator? How did it? How did you provide the information? Um, I'd noticed that Royal Commission was uh, kicking off about the, the responses to sexual abuse, and then I. I applied and then they gave me information. Then I had a private session and my statement, uh, I, I received uh, paraphernalia from the commission. I filled it out to my best of my knowledge. And then I came in for a private session. Yes, OK. And was the information in your statement compiled from the information in your private se session? Yes. All right. Uh, when you made the statement, was it the case that you only had one document and that was the letter from... Pastor Taylor. Yes. And so you tried to remember as best you could fitting events around that event. Yes. And is I think you readily admit that the dates are not meant to be set in cement. I've done the best that I can. And since that time you've had the benefit of reading um, Pastor Taylor's chronology and the other documents that she's put together and that's has that assisted you yes i was surprised that uh she'd helped it was my understanding that there was nothing being done and then reading her statements it it helped relieve some pain because i thought she actually put a hand up and did something and has it also assisted you with putting together the chronology of some of the events I think the statement was already done, but it has helped verify certain dates because she was an avid diary uh, keeper. I'm not. I'm only relying on memory. Excuse me. Oh, yeah, no, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, AHA, it's the case, isn't it, that you made your statement without the benefit of Barbara Taylor's notes? Yes. Uh, in fact, you only had the one letter uh, when you were making your statement. Yes. And the corrections that have you've made since then have been after you've had the benefit of seeing Barbara Taylor's notes. Yes, it filled in a couple of blank spaces. you some questions about the time of the abuse. All right. Now, you have said uh, in your evidence that you were seven or eight. Yes. And you recall that uh, Frank Houston signed your mother's diary the day before your birthday? The Bible, yes. I'm sorry? The day before my birthday, it's correct. And how old were you on that birthday? Eight. So, any suggestion that you were 12 or 13 at the time when the Houston stayed in your home would be incorrect, is that...? Completely wrong. I want to ask you some questions about the sleeping arrangements when the Houston stayed in your, your house. Can you just tell the Commission, why did the Houstons stay in your home? The Houstons came to stay with us. My father was an osteopath. Frank Houston 
liked free osteopathic treatments. The Houstons weren't as they are now financially secure and they were very poor. We fed them, we looked after them, we gave them free lodging and uh, they stayed with us because we were open uh, to the, uh, the whole Pentecostal movement. I take it that your parents trusted the Houstons? Yes. And were very hospitable to them? As I said in my statement, they were treated like royalty because they were special people, we believed. Right. And your parents had no reason to believe that their hospitality would be abused? None. I take it that your mother um, arranged the sleeping arrangements for the periods when the Houston stay? Yes, that's correct. All right. Can you just tell the Commission what those uh, sleeping arrangements were? We had a unit in Coogee. There was a, l a larger bedroom, which was my sister's room, was a double bed bunk. And then further through, there was a doorway into my veranda uh, where I slept. And Brian slept on the top bunk. Frank Houston slept on the bottom bunk and I slept in my room. My sister slept in her, my parents' room on, her mass, on Dad's massage bench. And that was for the period when the Houstons stayed? Yes. Right. And at the other time, your sister would sleep in her bedroom? Yes. Right. And you were, of course, alone in your own bedroom? Yes. Right. Okay. And how was the house arranged in terms of the distance in between the room where Brian and Frank Houston stayed. Miss McGlinchey, I, I don't think there's any issue, is there, about what, what has happened? Uh, I, I'm not... I, I'm only raising this because in one of the other statements it said that uh, it was suggested, I think, that um, uh, Frank Houston actually shared a room with AHA when they stayed. I, I'm not sure where the point goes. All right. OK, I think it's important to... My client's family that that's not the case. I see. All right. All right. All right. Well, I'll just put it to you. Were the sleeping arrangements ever that Frank Houston was uh, to, to sleep in your room? No. In the period when you were seven and eight, um, how old would um, uh, Brian Houston have been? I guess he was an older boy than me. He was a teenager. I would say he was... 18, 17, somewhere in that bracket. I can't be exactly sure. Did you spend a lot of time together when the Houston stayed? Yes, we used to go down to the beach. We'd do all things that kids would do, make sandcastles, swim together. I looked up to Brian, but he was an older boy than me, and I was just a young kid. All right, OK. And again, if there was any suggestion that you were 12 or 13 at that time, that would be incorrect? Incorrect. In the period that you've already described where Frank Houston was calling you uh, frequently, is that the case? Yes. All right. And calling your mother as well? Yes. All right. Did you ever initiate contact with him? No. All right. Uh, did you ever ask him for money? No. All right. Did you ever suggest that he should pay you money? No. All right. Okay. Just to be clear, uh, with the arrangement at to meet at Redfern... Who suggested... Was that to meet at... Uh, was the arrangement to meet at Redfern Station? That was between me and Frank uh, in the conversations and I felt that I was getting really... It was boiling down and I had to do something about it and I figured that if I meet him at a station in a public area, we can talk or whatever he wants to do with it. I didn't exactly know what the meeting or where he was going with that. Uh, who suggested Redfern Station? Brian, um, Frank Houston uh, mentioned it because at that stage I was living out the west and he was in the city, so he figured that if I could catch a train in and we'd be able to meet there, it would be convenient for both. All right. Now, that meeting, meeting never took place? I was uh, in the street opposite the station when I saw him pull up in his car. Uh, he didn't see me. I stepped back in towards Everly Street it uh, just gave me the shudders and I just froze and I couldn't, I couldn't bear being anywhere near him. I couldn't even look at him. Right. And to be clear, no money changed hands Nothing. on that occasion? I never spoke to him. Right. Now, in relation to the meeting at McDonald's, who suggested McDonald's as a meeting place? Again, that was because I'd bought a house on the Central Coast and moved up out of there. Frank wanted a meeting place, place that was mutual for both of us. So do you recall who suggested McDonald's? 
I, it was Frank at that stage who mentioned McDonald's. Right. Um, when you uh, agreed to meet, were you expecting that a third party would be at the meeting? No. All right. So you were surprised when you arrived and there was a third party? Yes. Right. Were you introduced? From memory, and it's vague, but um, Frank said this is something about my business advisor or someone along those lines, but mainly Frank was talking to me about getting on with this and getting forgiveness from me. He was more concerned about dying and answering God for what he'd done to me, and that was, that was where that started from. All right. And this third uh, party, can you describe them or him? From what I can remember of him, he was a short, stout man, balding, with a, a small moustache. But again, I didn't really look at him that much. He was onto my side, and he has had a hamburger. He was pushing into his face, and I couldn't really get a good look at him. All right. With the napkin that you signed, what do you know what happened to that? No. Napkin. No. Well, you didn't. You didn't take it away with you. No. Did you see Frank take it away with him? I don't remember who took it. I think. I think the um, the other person, the unnamed man. He grabbed it and crunched it up in his hands. But at that stage, I was leaving the table. I just wanted to get away from the whole situation. All right. Um, why do you think that these meetings were suggested in McDonald's and Redfern Station rather than in ch on church premises? Well, I'll object to that. Yes. Unless you've got instructions about something your client was actually no, no. told. Is no, I just, I just yeah. wanted his impression. That's fine. Come on. <clears throat> I've only got a few more minutes, so, Your Honour, if we could push on. Yes. And she's indicating, Mr AHA, that she's only got a few more questions. Um, just bear with me for a moment. I'm just going to check with Mr Beckett. We're going to try and, if we can, finish with you today and excuse you, and I'm sure that would be your preference. Thank you. Yes, I only had one, perhaps two questions. Um, uh, just briefly, AHA, um, I just want to give the uh, Commission a little bit of information about your life since the abuse. Uh, I believe you left school at in year 10? Yes. How old were you then? I think it was around 14. Right. And what has been your work history, if you could give a summary of that? It hasn't been good. Uh, I've suffered a lot of emotional problems uh, dealing with uh, elderly gentlemen, um, anger issues, uh, and this it seems to have really had a, a whitewash on my life. It just seems to have affected me um, deeply and it has a lot of effect on my personality and the way I'm dealing with people. Right. You are uh, currently 52 years old? Yes. You are living on the disability pension? Yes. Right. You, do you have any... Uh, I know you own a, a home with your partner? Yes. Right. Do you have any significant savings? No. Do you have any significant superannuation? Nothing. You've been diagnosed as having post-traumatic stress disorder? Yes. And at one time depression? Currently depression also. Thank you, Your Honour. Thank you, Mr Beckett. Yes, uh, Mr AHA, just uh, very briefly, um, I wanted to take you to the, the time between when you first spoke with uh, Pastor Barbara Taylor in November of 1998. Yes. Through until um, the end of 2000, so that's a period of, um, of about three years. Do you understand the period I'm asking you about? Yes. Yes. Uh, during that time, were you um, ever offered by a member of the Assemblies of God any um, contact with... Uh, a support service related to the police for, regarding victims of sexual abuse? No. My question. Thank you. So, Mr AHA, that completes um, your requirement for attendance at 
at the Royal Commission, so we're about to finish for the day, but um, just to confirm with you that you're now excused. Thank and, you. Um, thank you for your attendance. And Mr Beckett, the um, next witness... Yes, the next witness will be passed to Barbara Taylor. Uh, ...tomorrow morning at 10. Thank you. Thank you. All staff? <coughs>